as you know, today we 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 are meeting uh, with the with the members from the public who are going to make comments uh, on the division of revenue amendment bill drop as was presented by the Minister of Finance on the 26th of October. Uh, good morning, you are, you are all welcome. And I'll, I'll say exactly who's on the, on the platform. But before I do that, um, let me check with Lubabalo whether we do have any apologies from the select committee. Thank, th thank you, Chairperson. Good morning, Chairperson, and uh, good morning, members and colleagues. Chairperson, we have a few apologies committee. Uh, Honorable Nika, uh, she will be unable to join the meeting. Um, then there are two more, Honorable Karim and Honorable Masangu. They are going to join the meeting. However, Chair, they will leave uh, a little bit early. Uh, Honorable Karim will leave around 20 to 10 and Honorable Masangu around 11 o'clock, but they will join the meeting. Thank, thank you. Are they on the platform now? Uh, Honorable Masango is on the platform. Uh, I think I saw her. Honorable Karim has not joined yet. Okay. Uh, good, good, good morning, uh, on, on, Honorable uh, Chair Masango and Honorable uh, uh, Yunus Karim. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Honorable Chairperson. Thank, 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 thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Darren, do you have any apologies from your side? Good morning. Chair, co chairpersons, honorable members, yes, yes, we have apologies from Ms. Dihale, Ms. Peters, and uh, Ms. Nplang. We may indicated that you will join the meeting a little bit later. Thank you. Thank, 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 thank you, thank you so much. <clears throat> um, as I said, we have got uh, <clears throat> public hearings today, as enjoined by uh, our constitution, and. Uh, <clears throat> Also, uh, the Money Bills Act, that when you deal with these uh, 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 issues as a people's parliament, uh, as you deal with these laws, it's very important that uh, we also hear what the public has to say. And I want to welcome all of you. Uh, we are having South African Local Government Association, Rural Health Advocacy Project, TP Advocacy and Accountability Consortium, Amanda Dotmobi, Section 27, and Congress of South African Trade Unions. We are all, we are all welcome, and uh, we'll give you an opportunity. As the agenda suggests, uh, we request that you confine your presentations to 20 minutes. After all of you have done that, then I'll open uh, the forum to the, uh, to the honorable members for them to pose questions and make comments on what we have said, and then we'll make announcements and then we'll close the meeting. Uh, <clears throat> can I then request a South African Local Government Association, Salga, uh, to please come in and introduce yourselves and uh, uh, the, your, your delegation. Thank you very much. Salga, you have got uh, 20 minutes. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairperson. Uh, we are, it's Nyeba Mkotli from Salga. Uh, with me, I've got my the Chief Officer for Municipal Finance, uh, Mayor Komojo Lizati, and our leader of the delegation, Councillor Dekhale, is struggling to connect, but uh, we are proceeding as uh, instructed. With your permission, please. Please, please proceed and just time yourselves for 20 minutes presentation. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Nkotli. Is my presentation, my screen uh, viewable? Yes, it is, but just take it to, to the yes, there it is. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think in the interest of time, since of the 20 minutes, You've already, in your opening remarks, indicated what the purpose of the presentation is and the constitutional and legal background. I'm not going to go into it. Uh, also, the roadmap to, to where we are. I'm just going to start on the two areas, particularly the macroeconomic and fiscal policy outlook, 
and then I'll follow with the organized local government uh, comments on the 2022 MTPPS. Uh, firstly, on the on the macroeconomic uh, outlook, we note that uh, the projected economic growth uh, is uh, for 2022 uh, projected at 1.9 percent, 1.9 percent, and then it stabilizes at around about 1.8 uh, percent, which uh, brings us back through to the pre-pandemic uh, uh, levels. Uh, having uh, noted on the MTPPS document, particularly pages 11, 13, and 18, our comments are that uh, the public sector capital investments uh, remain below the 20% target of the National Development Plan. And the numbers presented in the MTPPS demonstrate that the country is not meeting its objective of catalyzing the economy through infrastructure investments. Also note the low uh, private uh, investment combined with low employment, employment levels, uh, which we consider to be a recipe for disaster uh, for municipalities. In this regard, uh, Salga would recommend the implementation of the economic recovery strategies uh, to assist businesses uh, in distress, as well as address the ESCOM uh, crisis. Uh, while uh, Salga applauds the National Treasury City Support Program, through the SEP National uh, Ease of Doing Business Reform Project. Uh, it is critical that the reform, the, the reform project uh, should be rolled out to other non-metropolitan municipalities. You'd recall, Chairperson, that uh, this program also uh, seeks to empower municipalities to be able to plan uh, or inculcate in their planning uh, the factoring in of climate change uh, considerations as we have seen in the recent floods and the destruction in the infrastructure. Hence, it is important that uh, other uh, municipalities other than the eight metros that currently focused on are also looked at because the climate change effect affects all municipalities uh, over and above the eight metros. Uh, in regard to, to the inflationary pressures, what we have noted, it's the 6.7% uh, projected for 2022. Uh, what we observe is that the inflationary con consequences have uh, been felt in South Africa already, as inflation is projected uh, to be at 6.7% in 2022, caused by dem uh, domestic uh, food inflation and ele 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 elevated fuel uh, prices. Uh, we consider that inflation will erode the disposable income of households reduce household consumption and affect uh, the economy. Uh, from the local government perspective, we note the increase in inflation will necessitate that households prioritize food consumption over payment of municipal services, uh, which will then negatively impact on municipal uh, revenue collection. Uh, in terms of the uh, fiscal policy outlook, uh, we noted government uh, plans to direct a portion of the higher than anticipated revenues uh, to ailing state-owned uh, entities. Uh, will one will elaborate further in the subsequent slides what we propose should happen in this. Uh, what is uh, worth noting is that the country's public debt rise has uh, risen sevenfold in 15 years, despite the fiscal consolidation posture taken by national government. And we find that uh, quite concerning. There are proposed in the allocations to Denel, Sandral, and Transnet, uh, amounting to about 30 billion, which government plans uh, and further government plans to take over a portion of the ESCOM 400 billion debt uh, that the minister indicated will be uh, considered in the 2023 budget. Uh, what we note is that uh, the fact that ESCOM's debt today is almost equivalent to what the national debt was in 2008 in fact, demonstrates exactly where our national borrowing over the past 15 years has been directed towards. Yet, we have nothing to show for this investment, with load shedding being at its worst since the first time we experienced it in the country in 2008. Also, emphasizing uh, what the minister indicated in his uh, MTPPS, that this debt is incurring a service, a debt service cost that will average about 355. 0.2 billion per year over the medium uh, term. 
Uh, these costs are against an average allocation to local government of about 174.3 billion over the 2023 MTF. Uh, we note that the rising debt uh, service costs are in contradiction to national government stringent uh, fiscal uh, consolidation stance in recent years. Further, the initial chapters of the MTPPS uh, centers its primary expenditure priorities around uh, electricity supply risks and urgent need to direct more funds and resources towards ESCOM. Uh, what we note is that, okay, correctly so, uh, electricity supply is deemed a growth a priority reform. Uh, included also in government growth strategies is improving municipal services, yet not much mention is made of the critical network uh, of infrastructure municipalities are responsible to uh, uphold. To emphasize uh, this point, there is a 6 billion rent disaster relief fund set aside of these funds, the Municipal Disaster Relief Response Grant receives only 247 million. The bulk of the funds are directed to provinces, a critical municipal infrastructure. In this instance, again, those do not receive the requisite a priority a funding. Of key concern is that risks that are outlined in the MTPPS seem to be discussed at national and provincial level. Uh, yet these risks have the most detrimental effect on municipalities and their ability to deliver on the basic uh, services of the mandate. Uh, in regard to, to the macroeconomic and fiscal policy outlook, uh, what Salga uh, concludes and recommends is that the government should implement economic recovery strategies that assist businesses in distress and address the ESCOM crisis. Further, Salga recommends that the ease of doing business reform projects should be rolled out to other non-metropolitan municipalities, uh, further uh, requiring Parliament to note that the public sector capital investment remains below the 20% target of the NDP, uh, which is intended to uh, be a catalyst uh, to economic growth. Uh, Parliament should note that the higher inflation levels would negatively uh, affect municipal revenue collection with households compelled to prioritize food consumption over payment of municipal services. Uh, the MTPPS acknowledges that electricity supply is correctly deemed a growth priority reform, yet not much mention is made uh, on the critical of the critical uh, network of infrastructure that municipalities are responsible to maintain. Uh, the MTPPS uh, outlines the fiscal risks at national and provincial level, whilst the coal phase uh, of service delivery being in municipalities where uh, these risks would have the most felt impact uh, are not uh, touched on uh, in the 2022 MTPPS. Now, on the second part of the, of the present of our presentation, uh, in these uh, comments to the 2022 MTPPS and the Division of Revenue Amendment Bill, uh, we note that uh, compared to the 2022 budget uh, organized local government, uh, we welcome the increase of a 3.6 billion upward revision on, on the cross allocation to local government for 2022-23. As you would note that in the uh, 2022 budget, that was 150.6 billion, and now it's 154.2 billion. The upward adjustment in the outer years of the MTF cycle representing 2.7% and 2.6% uh, for the 2023-24 financial years is also welcomed. We also note that the national government share uh, actually increases uh, from 49.7% to 50.6%, uh, whilst for provinces, uh, it actually decreases from 41.2% uh, to 43 we welcome that what was presented in February in regard to the uh, division of national raise revenue for local government that remains unchanged. The maintenance of the share for the local sphere of government is welcome as because this uh, means that the aspirations as contained on the white paper of local government, particularly on the responsibility of a national uh, and uh, other province of nation in terms of the responsibility of national to subsidize a local government, particularly in the provision of basic services. 
However, notwithstanding the fact that uh, monetary wise, there is an overall uh, increase when one compares through to uh, the February uh, budget, as well as uh, the, the 2022 MTPPS. For 2022-23, there's no change. For 2024-25, no change. However, uh, we note particularly uh, with concern the 0.1 percentage point decrease in the 2023-24. You'd note that the local government share of national raised revenue uh, over the 2023-24, uh, in, in February it was 10%, now it's about 9.9%, uh, meaning that uh, even though monetary-wise it still shows an increase, uh, but what uh, we had hoped is that uh, as more than anticipated revenue gets uh, received and allocations are made to other spheres, the percentages that have been agreed, which would show an upward trajectory for local government that should remain unchanged. Uh, in, in this respect, particularly for the year in question, uh, this one is that in 2022 February budget, it was 160.5 billion and now it's 164.9. Uh, but looking in the totality, it that represents a 0.1 percentage decline uh, overall. Uh, as organized local government to assert that the structural underfunding of the local sphere of government and the realization of the, as those aspirations as contained on the white paper cannot be attained by a decrease in the local government share of nationally raised revenue, even though negligible. Uh, I think uh, members would be familiar with this, uh, Chairperson, uh, it's the stance that uh, Salga's leadership continuously uh, emphasizes and raises sharply that when one enumerates the constitutional uh, functions that are assigned uh, to the various spheres of government, you'll note that the local sphere of government is allocated about 46% of the constitutional functions with national uh, assigned about 40% and province about 14%. However, this disequilibrium uh, results in that on the vertical allocation of revenue, the local sphere of government continues to receive about 9.1%, whilst the national sphere is about uh, 51%, and uh, prov the, prov uh, the provincial sphere about 40%, and uh, which is what we seek uh, to be done, uh, to be relooked and uh, improved. We have also uh, considered independent research uh, that has been done uh, according to the study by PARI, which stands for Public Affairs Research Institute in 2019, where amongst others found that uh, local government uh, is uh, underfunded uh, by approximately uh, 56 billion, being a conservative figure that was looked at at 2018-19. Uh, what the study also found was that the current equitable share model underestimates the cost of providing services and overestimates the contribution of own revenue uh, to funding these. Here we must uh, acknowledge that uh, they, although there's been a departure from the 90% uh, of own revenue that has been uh, assumed by the white paper, the current vertical allocation model, model uh, has now gone to reduce the extent of that to roughly about 75%, uh, which is welcome, but I think more work still needs to happen to improve that. The study also went uh, and indicated that the current underfunding of local government and its consequent uh, financial distress is a direct result of the fiscal assumptions made on the white paper, many of which have proven to be incorrect or which have not been implemented as envisaged. Uh, Starting uh, from the base year when the study was made, what we project is that the extent of the shortfall, looking at the conservative figure uh, to what uh, local government gets from national raised revenue uh, is about 67.1 billion. Uh, when one looks at the upper limit, that comes through to about 81.5 billion. Part of what has been discussed in the uh, MTPPS document 
uh, the largest transfer to municipalities in the local government equitable share, which grows by about 9% in 2023, 24, and 7.6%, 24, 25, and 6.8% in 25, 26. Uh, these above inflation increases account for growth in households numbers and higher bulk water and electricity costs. Uh, as I indicated earlier, having acknowledged for particularly the work that has emanated from our participation in the budget forum, as well as the recently held uh, local government summit, a uh, local government equitable share formula has been updated to account for projected household growth and increases in the cost of services. And uh, furthermore, uh, in the 2023 MTF, the MTPS indicates that uh, there is a review in the formula, which will include the creation of a fire services component uh, uh, and uh, the estimates of household growth. Uh, similarly to the study that was run, uh, uh, undertaken by study uh, titled uh, a critical review of local government uh, fiscal framework, uh, have indicated that in the current status quo, it is not subsidizing the true cost of providing uh, services. Uh, this is because, uh, in fact, it emphasizes that the free basic service allowance to registered indigent households is not adequate to address the, the social wage erosion or deficit. This is because 40% of all South Africans live below the lower bound poverty line. Uh, they have to sacrifice spending on food to be able to afford non-food items, and this is not acceptable. Uh, this study shows that only 3.6 million households are registered as indigents. As organized local government to support the refinement of the local government equitable share formula in an effort to arrive at the cost reflective basis for the rendering uh, basic municipal services. In line with the FFC, titled Costing of Municipal Services to Inform DORA, uh, long indicated that the current formula does not. Uh, take into account the cost for firefighting services, which were declared uh, in the refinement in 2023, this will be included. However, there are still other components uh, of cemeteries and municipal health services that need to be taken uh, into consideration. Uh, what does this current local government fiscal frame, framework uh, look like when you drill down in the for the current financial year uh, 87.3 uh, relates to equitable share 51.5 uh, to conditional grants and the general fuel levy so over the mtf cycle it's about 523 um, billion that is allocated to the local sphere and which grows with an above uh, inflationary uh, level in fact we also note on the annual growth rates on the allocations of local government that they are far above for the other two uh, spheres, which is something uh, that is welcome. Uh, the 2022 MTPPS recognizes that local government cannot solely uh, be responsible for the distribution. Uh, and national government has a critical role to play in this regard, particularly with respect to subsidizing the provision of basic services uh, that is uh, cited from the white paper on local government of which is something that uh, it is uh, welcomed. In regard to, to the uh, ESCOM debt restructuring, uh, the minister indicated that uh, government plans to provide debt relief to ESCOM as part of comprehensive uh, approach to address the utilities challenges. In fact, the, MTTP, the MTPPS also notes that ESCOM does not generate sufficient revenues or control its cost. In, in the similar vein, the MTTP MTPPS observes that uh, by the end of the third quarter of the 2021-22 uh, financial year, there were about 43 municipalities were experiencing financial and service delivery crises as defined in the MFMA. We recommend as Salga that any envisaged bailout to ESCOM uh, must be comprehensive enough to also consider the debt owed by municipalities to ESCOM. That is any percentage uh, extent of alleviating the debt burden of ESCOM, a reciprocal uh, approach 
should be actually considered to also alleviate the debt burden, particularly for those municipalities that have got debt owed to ESCOM, that such a debt alleviation must be done, particularly for those municipalities in financial distress. We consider that this approach shall ensure that the intervention is comprehensive and multi-pronged in its approach. In regard to other SOEs, Ella indicated that I will elaborate further on this. Government is allocating 30 billion to Sandra, Transnet, and Danel, uh, with the MTPPS noting that all three companies are important enablers of economic growth but face near term challenges that require immediate financial distress, as the MTPPS uh, observes, of 43 of them has indicated that they have financial distress. Notwithstanding the acknowledgement in the minister's speech that municipalities shape the living conditions of our people by ensuring that people have access to clean, clean drinking water, energy, housing, and, and sanitation, the 2022 MTPPS does not provide measures to address risk challenges experienced by municipalities in financial distress. We recommend that consulted effort be exerted to other SOEs bailout in alleviating the financial challenges uh, experienced by municipalities in financial distress. It is supposed that a proportion of the higher anticipated revenues uh, be utilized to alleviate financial pressures for municipalities in financial distress. Firstly, such intervention should be accompanied by stringent conditions. Uh, PS indicates that we are adopting best practices in the best practices of transparency in the tender process. Such modernization aims to simplify and speed up the process for public infrastructure projects whilst reducing the scope for looting and corruption. As organized local government, uh, we support so further in an effort to inculcate a culture of professionalism, accountability, and consequence management in local government sector. Uh, the organization has partnered with the Chartered Institute for Procurement and Supply, uh, which is CIPS. The CIPS is the only SAPA recognized professional body for procurement and supply in South Africa. It is a professional body, an organization with individual members practicing the procurement and supply profession. To this end, SALGA is encouraging municipal employees to belong to CIPS in order to enable municipal SCM officials to be accountable to a professional body and be subject to its uh, code of ethical conduct. Further, the MTPS uh, notes on particularly building a capability for service delivery that government spent about 9.1 billion across 40 state agencies in 1920 to help municipalities build capacity and function efficiently. Following the National Treasury's review of the capacity building system, a government is developing a, a multi-year program to improve its outcomes and cost effectiveness. In fact, Treasury will finalize the design of a revised program and agree an integrated approach for local government capability development during 2023. In response to this, as organized local government, we support this. In fact, SALGA, in collaboration with stakeholders such as National Treasury, Department of Cooperative Governance, and uh, Traditional Affairs, as well as the LG CETA, we have rolled out capacity building initiative for councillors uh, deployed to municipal public accounts committees and finance portfolio committees as part of the second phase of the integrated councillor induction uh, program. Mr. Mkotri, in, 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 in Mr. Mkotri, respect of uh, the... Mr. Mkotri. I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm please, wrap up. Up. Yes, please wrap up. Uh, please wrap up. Yes, Chairperson. Chairperson? Yes, I was saying, please wrap up. Your okay, I'm, ra I'm, I'm wrapping up, Chairperson. Okay. Good. On the updating of the municipal borrowing framework, okay, I'm, I'm wrapping up your person. Yeah, this is the second last slide. I'm, I'm almost coming through to the recommendations. 
uh, on the updated municipal borrowing uh, policy framework, which the 2022 MTPPS makes sight of, uh, what we have done is salga enable projects that will unlock financing for infra infrastructure projects. Salga has developed an accredited early stage project preparation course for municipalities. Uh, the, here we are collaborating with the infrastructure fund and the DPSA to support municipality on project preparation uh, and qualification for the budget facility for infrastructure. Yeah, it, in fact, in the budget for Ramle Hotla, the concept paper on this was actually endorsed. And in conclusion, uh, Chairperson, uh, we welcome the 2.4% upward revision of the cross allocation to local government as well as the upward adjustment in the two outer years of the MTF cycle. And number two, SALGA demands that there should be no reduction in the percentage share of local government from nationally raised revenue. For instance, there is a 0.1 percentage point decrease in the local government share of nationally raised revenue in 2023-24 financial year when compared to the 2022 budget. Uh, we, Parliament uh, notes that there is a disequilibrium in the allocation of resources versus the allocation of functions, and this dis disequilibrium is being attended to with ongoing work following the Budget Forum of 3 October 2022 and the recently held Local Government Summit. The Parliament notes that uh, according to the study of the party, uh, there is currently an underfunding uh, by an inflation-adjusted amount of 67.1 uh, billion, uh, sorry for that, and 81.5 billion, uh, the upper part of the of the of the shortcoming, uh, it's not million as it, uh, reflected there. Salga supports the refinement of the LGS formula in an effort to arrive at a cost basis, a cost reflective basis for rendering municipal uh, basic municipal services. And uh, number six, which is most also important, not that the others are not recommends that any envisaged bailout to ESCOM must be comprehensive enough to also consider the debt owed by municipalities to ESCOM. That is, any percentage alleviation of the debt, bar debt burden to be proposed in the upcoming 2023 budget. Government should, should alleviate the debt burden that is offset, the debt owed by municipalities in financial distress to ESCOM. There must be a reciprocal re percentage reduction in the debt owed by municipality in distress to ESCOM with conditions, this approach shall ensure that the intervention is comprehensive and multi-pronged. Uh, the, the 43 municipalities who are also experiencing financial distress uh, in a similar effort as the Sandral, Danel, uh, are actually bailed out. Uh, such a consideration should be done uh, for municipalities, obviously, with uh, conditions. And Parliament should note measures uh, adopted by Salga to professionalize the SCM function in local government. Uh, further, that Salga supports the integrated approach to local government capability development led by Treasury and support the update to the municipal borrowing policy framework. Uh, the upward trajectory in the local government uh, allocations from nationally raised, re uh, raised revenue be maintained in order to realize the aspirations contained uh, on the white paper on local government in respect of subsidizing uh, the provision of basic services. I thank you, Chairperson. Uh, sorry as well for having gone the allotted time. I thank you. No, 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 no problem, um, uh, MST. Um, thank, thank you very much. I've negotiated uh, with uh, Kosato that uh, um, they donate uh, five minutes to you. So you owe Kosat in your in your debt, you must know that you owe Kosat five minutes. Eh? Thank you. No intention, <laughs> uh, Okay, can we then go to Rural Health Advocacy Project? And uh, please uh, introduce yourself and your team. Thank you. Rural Health, unmute yourself. Do we have uh, Rural Health on the platform? Chairperson, earlier on, I saw Russell. Uh, he there's, is there's on the platform. He's the co host. Uh, over to you, Chairperson. He's on the platform. Uh, Russell, please, please come in. Good morning, Honourable Chair. It's Russell Rainsbeck here. 
I don't know if uh, Darren. Good morning, Honorable Chair and Honorable Committee members. How are you today? We're fine, thanks. How are you? The most we welcome. are grateful. Thank you. I, I don't know if Darren's um, loaded our presentation. Yes. Yes. So if we can just look. Look, uh, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members, um, our presentation is very short. We're not going to need as many minutes. And I think the MTPS really didn't. You know, I think our main concern going into this particular process was that's, what is the outlook look like? Sorry. That's before uh, 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 Mr. Rensbeck, before you proceed. Uh, Darren, we, we, we don't have the presentation by uh, a uh, royal health advocacy on the, on the screen. Can I'm, we correct I'm, that? I'm, I'm loading it, Chaperson. Please load it then. Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, please say you can then proceed. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. Oh, this, this is the wrong presentation, um, Honorable Chair. We submitted two presentations, one from the TB Advocacy Accountability Project and one from Rural Health. So if, if we could get the one from Rural Health Advocacy Project, not the TB Accountability one. Thank you, Honorable okay. Chair. That, that's fine, let's, let's get the correct one, please. I'm sure that's the, that's the correct one. That's the correct one. Thank you, Honorable Chair and Honorable Committee members. Honorable Chair and um, committee members of the Lead Committee on Appropriations. My name is Russell Rensberg. I'm from the Rural Health Advocacy Project and our mission is to promote and protect and realize the right to health of rural communities. Um, the next slide, can I have control over this? Can I have the, the next slide? Secretary. Secretary, please can you also help with the slide, moving the slides. Uh, please get it on, on the slide mode and then let's, let's proceed. Hello, Chairperson. Is, is my screen not visible, Chair? Is the screen is visible. Yeah, but you, he's, he's asking that you also move the slide for him. Yeah, and yes, on, the, on, okay. the slide mode, on the slide mode. Okay, Chair. Move to the next slide then. Marcel, I'm on slide number two now. Which slide do you want to see? We're not see we're seeing slide number one. Um, We're seeing one on our side. Wrong screen share. Unshare, share again. Okay, okay. Let, let, me, let me start again, Chairperson. My apologies, Chairperson and members. Please. Thank you for your patience, honorable chair and honorable members. No, no problem. I move. Okay. Take your, take your time, Lubaba. Take your time. Okay, chair. Thank you, chair. Okay. okay, take it to slide mode then. Yeah, there you go. Go to the next slide. Yeah, good. Uh, Mr. Ranspeck, please continue. Yeah, the, the, uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. You know, the medium budget policy statement is, is really just, you know, was, was stable at a time of significant uncertainty. You know, at a global level, we transitioned from COVID, from the COVID crisis to a greater geopolitical crisis, you know, with the war in Ukraine and elsewhere. And all of these things have, sort of have an impact on the outlook that Treasury presented to us in the October medium term budget policy statement. There were no significant adjustments really to the health budgets or any amendments proposed. But I think it was concerning for us was all of these risks and uncertainties and the outlook presented by Treasury has a really dire impact on certainty around funding of key socioeconomic rights. You know, we've seen rising fuel costs, food costs, along with rising interest rates and high inflation and, and, and low growth that's been constrained ultimately by a lack of um, constrained energy supply. And you know all of that contributes to Treasury's outlook, which is 1.6% over the next three years at nominal levels. And I think when we adjust for inflation at 7%, the outlook becomes even more dire. 
because in real terms, our available funding and our growth will be negative. In added to that, the, the exclusions, we got some directions in the MP, NPPS that, that, ESCOM, that the government is looking to take on ESCOM's debt, but no clear idea on just how much. And added to that, you know, we didn't, despite the fact that, you know, we can almost with certainty say that we will have public sector wage increases, we haven't got any guidance in the 2022-3 outlook in terms of what those increases will look like. And next slide, please. Just down. So when we look at the outlook over the, the next while, the provincial share allocations or the provincial equitable share for the next financial year actually reduce slightly before increasing again in 2023-24 and 2024-25. The problem with the slight increases is that none of those are guaranteed. And in some ways, all that they do is factor in possible wage increases, leaving the, the net budget available for service delivery slightly less. So if we consider, next slide, please. If we consider that healthcare services are primarily delivered by provinces and is funded through provincial equitable share allocations, the fact that the equitable share allocations start reducing and then whether it increases is uncertain. You know, there's a real and present danger that access and, and, and quality of publicly funded healthcare services are at an absolute, absolute risk of regressing over the next couple of years. Wages make up 60 to 70% of public of, of provincial health budgets. So any increase above 3%, which is currently factored in for 2024-2025 will have a significant impact on what money is available for delivering um, priority healthcare services to a healthcare system that's already in decline. Now, as, as activists, non-state actors, and I would dare say parliamentarians are workers guided by the constitution of the Republic, which places like a responsibility on the state to progressively expand access to healthcare services and I think Parliament has a particular responsibility to protect access to health, especially in times of fiscal constraints. Next slide, please. So when we look at the Constitution, I don't, when we look at the, the Constitution, um, 1627 talks about realizing the right to health care access should be understood through in, in achieving universal health coverage defined by access, quality, and affordability in health for all. You know, deepening quality of healthcare service for a few cannot be prioritized over increasing access to healthcare for the majority of the population, because this is neither ethical or efficient. You know, for South Africa, this is largely requires better investment in primary healthcare services and the focus on rural areas, which suffer historical and ongoing low service coverage. We have to start thinking about rethinking how we are resourcing our health systems, whether we have the adequate health workforce, whether we have the relevant information to be able to make the kind of decisions, and whether our budget mechanisms are responsive enough to the challenges we face, and other than the healthcare service that we want. As REP, we see our government's responsibility as ensuring the optimization of current health spending to secure more equitable access to primary healthcare towards achieving universal health coverage. Honorable members, you will know that universal health coverage is a goal that South Africa signed up to as part of the UN um, commitment to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. In practical terms, that means that we expect, while we have a very large footprint of healthcare facilities, enjoyment of health is not equal across all populations. And when we look at indicators like maternal and child health, infectious diseases, and um, non-communicable diseases, we'll see that while we've made progress over the last 20 years, that progress wasn't homogenous. You know, in fact, there's a lot of heterogeneity, meaning that a lot of the 40 or so rural districts have worse health outcomes, often through no fault of their own. But as we start looking forward from this once in a generation crisis, we need to start being a little bit more intentional about how we think about the connection of our legislative responsibility our fiscal planning and our implementation to ensure that we start giving life to 
Section 9 of the Constitution, where all people can have equal enjoyment of all rights, including the right to health. We argue that building resilient health systems is inseparable from this aim. Rural proofing our current policies, challenges, and core, and core features of inequality while improving access for health, the majority of the underserved must be a priority. We know that such a process is not simple. You know, because it's very difficult to turn a big oil tanker around both slow and difficult, and there are fair amounts of political contestation around which are the priorities that we should meet and which are not. The, the harsh reality that we're facing is that we simply cannot continue the way that we are. We need immediate steps towards realizing our ethical obligations. I just want to sort of, if you look at COVID, I'm going to pause for a moment. When we look back over the last 18 months, on and and over the last two years now, because we entered into COVID, the COVID lockdowns around 27th of March in 2020, while the country invested a significant amount of energy, time, and commitment to ensuring that we manage the response to COVID in an equitable way, on evidence we didn't. You know, if you look at hospital admissions during the COVID period, despite only covering 20% of the population or 15% of the population close to half of all COVID related hospital admissions happened within the public sector, within the private sector. Similarly, when it came to access to testing, the vast majority of tests were completed in the private sector and testing rates while improving over the, the course of the, the epidemic or the pandemic was, were significantly lower when you look at the population at risk within the public sector. The impact of COVID has also had more financial impacts. The longer term fiscal shocks of COVID are still with us. And in many ways, it's unclear whether our fiscal response fairly considers the, the, the impact of COVID on the future and the, the, the strengthening of the health system. Inequality of access to healthcare points to this unequal distribution of resources. Next slide, please. So, Despite these multiple pressures that we face, we believe that substantial grounds exist for progressively realizing South Africans' constitutional right to health within current constraints. With limited funds, we cannot do everything at once, right? But we can't also deny that there are certain hard choices that we need to make. However, we think that government and parliament's obligation specifically should be that this right should be understood as prioritizing a more equitable and fair access to healthcare for the majority. As part of our recommendations, we feel that it, it was, it's within the purview of Parliament as the legislative head of, of, of our political system to reflect on what the response to these const resource constraints that are that exist in the outlook and possibly beyond, and how best we as a country or the, the government can respond or the state. You know, I think sometimes we interchange state and government and party, but literally, if you look at the different responsibilities within the system, the legislative responsibility sits with parliament, the implementation responsibility sits with the Department of Health, you know, and ensuring that we have the right political accountability, you know, is kindly primarily sits with parliament and these committees. We would recommend that given the uncertainties of the future outlook, can I have the next slide, please? that parliament seriously considers convening a special joint sitting of the committees um, for appropriations, finance, health. And we, we ask that the, the terms of reference of this committee consider our provincial departments who are responsible for delivering healthcare services to the majority of the population are reflecting on these rights. We have very good resource allocation uh, processes at the national level through the provincial equitable share, through conditional grants. But once grants arrive at the provinces, the provinces have the duty or the, the burden of ensuring that those resources are equitably shared. Unfortunately, at the moment, we don't have a transparent mechanism to show how these decisions are made and what efforts provinces are making to prioritize that access to priority groups or underserved groups like rural communities are prioritized. Parliament and the committees mentioned here through the Committee for Health, the, the National Council of Provinces, the Standing Committee on Appropriations and Finance have had joint sittings before. So this is not something that would be new, but this one could focus specifically on how we manage 
um, pu the public sector health delivery over the coming years and with that explicit um, obligation of trying to figure out how do we protect access to healthcare for the 80% of the population who are completely reliant on it? Thank you. Over. The slide. <clears throat> thank you, um, Honorable Chair. Okay. Uh, 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 thank you so much, uh, Mr. Rensbeck from Royal Health Advocacy Project. Uh, then we'll go to Amanda.mobi. 20 minutes. Amanda, please. Hello, Chair. Before, before Amanda, there is a second one, um, TB Advocacy. Oh. oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, we've got, sorry, sorry, Amanda. Don't move. Just hold on. Let me allow TB Advocacy and Accountability Consortium. 20 minutes. Hello. Good morning. Good morning, ma'am. Yes, good morning, honorable members and honorable chair. I will be, yes, I will be, um, <laughs> I'll be speaking from um, Mr. Russell Rensberg's. Um, That's fine. That's yes. fine. That's fine. Okay. Please introduce, introduce yourself. Hello. Yes, good morning. Yes, can you yes. hear me? <laughs> I can, we can hear you now. I, I was just a late before you proceed. Please uh, introduce yourself. All right. Thank you so much. Good morning, Honorable Chair, and good morning to the Honorable Committee members as well. My name is Sihe Mahonga, and I am the Project Officer at the TB Advocacy and Accountability Consortium based at the Rural Health Advocacy Project. And I shall be giving the um, TB AAC um, the, our submission on the case of the TB Recovery Plan for resilient recovery. Um, okay, part of what the submission stemmed from is the devastating results of the COVID pandemic on the TB program. The decline in TB notifications reversed the trend of the previous two years, as well we see the um, decline in testing and diagnosis nationally. TB mortality sadly has increased for the first time in decades and with an estimated 1.3 million deaths globally. Despite this, um, TB is both preventable and treatable, and TB remains the leading cause of death from a single infectious disease. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of these results of the, um, of the TB program, the TB Care Cascade for 2022 shows that over a third of the estimated 228,000 patients were successfully treated. Um, and almost 120,000 people with TB had not been diagnosed or initiated on treatment. Mm -hmm. And as we see in the recently released WHO annual global TB report, an estimated 304,000 people fell ill with TB, resulting in 56,000 of those um, related to HIV and AIDS. And this is really saddening, obviously, um, you know, as we were dealing with COVID, there was then this additional, um, you know, knock-on effect within the TB program that has had a very negative effect. And, on, and in response to this, the National Department of Health, supported by the National TB Think Tank, as well as other um, civil society organizations, released the TB, the TB Recovery Plan, which aims to reverse the losses incurred during the pandemic to get the TB program back on track. Next slide, please. This TB recovery plan is premised on improving case finding through um, universal TB testing, linkage to care, strengthening retention, and strengthening TB prevention. Um, this plan, in essence, is trying to aid the national strategic plan. And so um, it is really important for us to kind of understand the 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 implications of it not being you know like implemented and so can we please go to slide four now if you're understanding the this recovery plan in terms of our um our fiscal processes the mtbps or the minute or the mini budget provided an update on government economic outlook and gives a key government priorities now, as we see in terms of the graphs, um, Treasury's up, up, 
updated economic outlook revised its forecast um, is downward, sadly. And as we see within the next three years, this trend is going to um, go down. Um, and these are, you know, sadly, um, very conservative outlooks. So this might actually worsen within the next two to three years. Next slide. Now, in understanding the program itself or the plan and understanding these fiscal processes or this fiscal squeeze that we might be seeing within the next two to three years, we can understand that the TB program is primarily funded from provincial health budgets. The um, TB case finding and retention and care um, require sufficient health workers or HR at the, these appropriate provincial levels. And sadly, those, um, those current allocations um, of workforce are, are not enough to deal with the current needs that are needed. Um, yet there is an estimated 28,000 health vacancies um, which are still vacant. Um, these increased HR costs versus resource allocation along with other points impact the, the consistent availability of medicines or TB medicines required to achieve some of the TB recovery plan um, targets. Next slide. As the TB accountability and advocacy um, project, our, um, this is our point of assertion as part of the constitutional guarantees of Section 27's access to healthcare for all. We have emerged from the heights of COVID-19 and we've, we are facing a healthcare system characterized by lack of resourcing, um, deepening deepening inequality and the system that is in need of renewal. Significant resource constraints define the foreseeable future. And unless these fault lines are confronted, um, our health system is going to remain fragile regardless of resource availability. Next slide. In understanding this constitutional right of of section 27, Parliament is mandated with the responsibility of progressively realizing the constitutional right to healthcare, as well as other socioeconomic rights. Sadly, our needs in South Africa deeply exceed current provisions, and it's within the legislative mandate to consider what measures are necessary to protect access to healthcare services. Next slide. <laughs> Within the mandate to progressively expand access to healthcare, um, we need in greater consideration be given to prioritizing those with the least access. Um, as, we, as the TBAAC project is part of the Rural Health Advocacy Project, this is one of our main focuses of our mission and vision. And amidst uncertainty of future funding flows, it is essential that Parliament considers how existing publicly funded healthcare capacity is optimized and prioritized with those with the greatest need. And thus, we, we recommend that Parliament um, provides the TB recovery plan is fully funded, that it is prioritized, and most importantly, implemented. Next slide. As TBAC, we would like to recommend a joint committee to be set up temporarily to review and interrogate these provincial departments' resource allocation decisions for the next three to four years to ensure that strategies are in place, ensuring that priority healthcare services, such as and mainly within TB, are not compromised by the, the um, incoming fiscal squeeze. This committee should be jointly comprised by the Standing Committee on Finance, the Standing Committee on Appropriations, the, the National Council of Provinces, as well as the Portfolio Committee for Health. These appropriate representatives from provincial departments, such as head of departments, should engage with this committee to present on and further explain on how the allocations are given by their annual performance plans and are intentionally prioritizing efficient coverage for the most vulnerable. In understanding what the TB accountability and advocacy project stands is we are wanting for increased accountability in financial, programmatic and political accountability to see that the, the TB program outcomes are realized. Next, next slide, please.
Thank you. The reality is that in, in South Africa, TB is amongst the leading causes of death. We believe that the successful implementation of the TB recovery plan can help in reversing this decline in TB outcomes. And governance is a key point in seeing the plan succeed. And so we also believe that good governance requires good data. Currently, the TB data is recorded in two separate silo systems, which makes it very difficult to track patients whether all positive cases are linked to care, let alone those who are re retained and ultimately complete the TB program outcomes. Lastly, the TB Advocacy and Accountability um, consortium recommends that, that this joint committee should invite submissions from the National Institute of Communicable Diseases to gain insights into what is needed to strengthen the data success and the use for decision making and oversight. Ultimately, our appeal to you is for you to consider these implications of how um, this TB program has on our national health system. We're already incredibly burdened you know, um, we already have a massive burgeoning, you know, like half case um, crisis. And if we don't leave this unattended, honorable members, we are going to have to um, make very hard and very difficult decisions going down the line, particularly because we are mandated to serve those that are our constituencies. I thank you very much. Hey, hey. <clears throat> Thank, uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Sihe. I didn't hear the surname again. Mahonga. Mahonga, okay. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Mahonga. Uh, for thank that you so much. For that presentation. Uh, can I then request Amanda Dotmobi uh, to come in, please? And please introduce yourselves, uh, Amanda Dotmobi. Thank you, Honorable Chair, and good morning to everyone. My name is Clarissa Oba, and I'm a campaigner at Amanda Dodmobi. Honorable Chair, please allow me to share my screen uh, so I can uh, show my presentation. Thank you. Greetings, members of the Appropriations Committees. We stand before you today to represent nearly 1 million people who have signed petitions to increase the child support grant or to make the 350 grant permanent and increase it to at least 1,335 per month and turn the 350 grant into a basic income grant. These are the very people who are impacted the most by the cost of living crisis and by the decision to not allocate enough funds to increase social grants enough that underpin the 2022 Division of Revenue Amendment Bill. Tens of thousands have called for the 350 grant to be extended, and on that note, just as we did last year, we welcome government's decision to extend the 350 grant to March 2024. This intervention goes to show that some of the demands of the people are taken into consideration. However, this is once again still not enough. The Amanda Dunmobi community, as well as the public, are disappointed that the grant was not increased and expanded to include more people. For a long time, countless people have pleaded with Treasury to find budgets to not only extend, but to also increase the 350 grant and turn it into a basic income grant. If any members of this committee believe that we can't afford to increase the 350 grant, we challenge you to publicly forego your salary for three months and live on 350 grant a month. Treasury was magically able to find 23 billion rand to pay off Sunrall's e toll debt. That exists today because of the arrogance of government to force through e tolls even when it was rejected by the people. Instead, years later, money that could have increased the 350 grand so people don't go hungry must pay off debt that was avoidable. We all know that 350 grand is not enough. Even Minister Zulu herself has admitted to that to us in person. 350 came not as saying 350 is adequate. 350 can never be adequate. Let's put that straight. 350 is not enough. What must happen for Treasury and Parliament to find the political will to significantly increase social grants? 
Honorable members, you may be aware that many people have been excluded from the grant while many continue to struggle to get it. During the months of April and May this year, no payments of the 350 grant were made at all. Imagine if none of you received your salary for the next two months and then half of you had your salary declined. These persisting 350 grant problems undermine the much needed extension because if people aren't getting it, then who was this grant extended for? Treasury and the Department of Social Development created this crisis, which has now resulted in underspending on the 350 grant. We call on this committee to demand Treasury to answer for their role in the massive problems administering the 350 grant since April and to outline how they will compensate the millions of people who were denied the grants because Treasury and DSD didn't do their job. Trust us when we say people are angry. Since the introduction of the 350 grant, recipients have gone from pillar to post to get their grant. System glitches, maladministration, and corruption has seen millions of people struggling to get the grant, and in some instance, having to pay money they don't have just so they can get their grant. SATA and DSD have since changed methods in which people can get their grant, but still new problems keep emerging. Has this committee looked into what DSD has done to stop this? Our government seems to be under the impression that simply extending the 350 grant is enough without realizing that the extension still does not provide security if people still have to worry about what comes next. The failure to make commitment to future plans surrenders the marginalized majority to vulnerability while the wealthy continue to have the sense of security and protection through policies and budgets tabled each year. For over two years now, the basic income grant debate has been going on and on with many favoring this idea as the quickest way to get financial support to those struggling to survive. This basic income grant that you are talking about, it is this department that brought back the discussion about the basic income grant because we were looking for what can we have long term instead of short term 350. Most people have agreed including the president himself. He has agreed it's important for us to implement the basic income grant. It is disappointing that there has been no commitment to a permanent solution to help lift millions of people out of poverty, such as increasing the 350 grant and turning it into a permanent basic income grant. Honorable members, it is unacceptable that the MTBPS delivered by the Minister of Finance has stated that the costs of extending the 350 grant will come at the expense of other social grants, which will increase below inflation. In the midst of a cost of living crisis, Treasury has reduced the overall budget for social grants by 6 billion rand. This decision to sacrifice the poor to aid the poor is devastating, undermines the purpose of social grants, and indicates that the government will sacrifice the poor to protect the rich. Once again, we bring to your attention that the current grants are not enough and we have constantly called for increases on all grants, especially the child support grants and the old age grants. For years, this committee has received messages from the goggles of the Peter Maritzberg Pensioners Forum. We, have, we haven't been able to get many more messages from the goggles for you today because we are a small NGO and since April, we have been working nonstop to assist those cut off from the 350 grant. Inclusive public participation cannot be outsourced to one NGO. We call on this committee to work with the goggles to arrange for them to be able to participate in these public hearings again. We know this committee does not directly deal with tax, but when Treasury refuses to tax in a way that ensures there is a large enough pie to share, this committee is left with increasing pressure to slice a pie that is smaller and smaller as our people grow more hungry. In his empty BPS, Minister Godongwana avoided mentioning increasing taxes for the rich. Treasury acting DG Ismail Momoniet even denied a wealth tax would raise enough money to help fund BIG and instead proposed a value-added tax increase 
or increase in personal income tax to fund BIG. A VAT increase cannot happen because the poor majority are already struggling to put food on the table and will be hurt the most. To give an example, in the 2018 VAT hike was anti-poor and should never have been passed. The only way to try to limit the impact of the VAT hike was calling for more items to be zero rated. While we welcomed the removal of VAT on sanitary pads, zero rating is not a silver bullet. For many sanitary pads are unaffordable even though they are VAT free. And now DG Momoniet suggests VAT would have to be an option to fund BIG, taking more money from the poor to fund the poor. We are explaining tax issues to you so you can talk to your colleagues on the finance committees. The cost of living is too high. And it is this government's responsibility to ensure the marginalized majority is protected at all times. A VAT increase will leave households needing even more money to afford basics, which will also mean moving steps backwards because the aim of social grants and demanding a BIG is to help families afford basic needs and live decently. The 300,000 plus multimillionaires in this country should be taxed more to help promote equal distribution of wealth. Munguko kunora ema respect. Sia kala. Oguti. Siba fige si tel. Sila mbil. Konke kukukugi. Sia tel anko siam. Oguti natis nagelel. Chinas tole gansi mas koke langsho mas klapsan. Oguti masifa. Sina hiwa i sinch. I'm also in favor for the, the basic income and for the social relief of that we from 18 years old to 59, as we are all struggling. I just hope that the Treasury will see that in and help the people of South Africa to alleviate the poverty. The savings as now and the savings is holding an end and they are the spilling high and the margin and the symbol was clamped also for the etsekaka. In a solar lavanto and a name was put and allow me to 50. One of whom a leg was it in a swap while it's in a school in Danny, what we give him Bell and the budget checkers for a lay on you know, thirty seven years of age and seven. The Pilange grant, even to Nabam about Tatu over Ocala, also banana nineteen, Kenyan is out December twenty three. Yeah, Jablela Uti, Madi Kupu, and Bona Kuzong Caesar. Somewhere, somehow, John Thomas Sebenzi, John Munto, or South Medigil, who men would say, Max Vavilama post and apply because I'm over age. So, uh, Wuko Essen, I went, I sang Fana no Munto, or I mean, elderly, we could kill it. While Melania Fila would see, uh, sang a corn with his sevens, go to a gay. South Africa, I think it's a very good idea to increase the caregivers money, especially the children, because the children are the ones that they it's not their fault that they are. The government must look after the children because they are the future of South Africa. Hi, my name is Ndomiaise. I am a single mother of three children. I am unemployed, but I am braiding people's hair. My social release grant was denied because of the little amount I transfer into my account, which does not last me even a month. I am pleading to Minister Godongwana to please fight corruption, increase the tax of the rich, give more than 250 to all caregivers. We are suffering. Thank you. Honorable members, what you just heard is nothing new. These are demands and pleas of ordinary, everyday people. Over the years, at these public hearings, we have shared with you messages from the people who will be most impacted by your decisions. We have shared with you messages we have played for you during public consultations for the past three years, yet we still come again with the same demands. Hundreds of thousands continue to support the call to tax the rich to increase grants and fund a basic income grant to implement a basic income support for people aged 18 to 59, 
who increased the old age grant to 2,500 and give pensioners a 13th check in December to expand the child support grant to include pregnant mothers and to increase the sugary drinks tax. Amanda.mobi and many other organizations have called for a basic income grant for people with little to no income to be able to support themselves. By increasing the 350 grant and making it permanent, it could easily be turned into a basic income grant. Treasury, Treasury has instead proposed a new grant to replace the 350 grant and the basic income grant with a household grant that experts have clearly criticized to be problematic and exclusionary for even more people outside of those who are already declined for the 350 grant. Is this committee aware of this? What has this committee done to help change this and keep the basic income grant on the cards? We put the responsibility on this committee to ensure that Treasury starts taking the lives and the demands of the poor majority seriously. On 18 October 2022, we protested outside Treasury to make and deliver our demands before the MTBPS. A Treasury representative accepted our memorandum and later sent a communication acknowledging the receipt of the memorandum and committing to respond by 24 October 2022. Till today, there has not been a response or a follow-up. Members of the public are always encouraged to participate in public processes, but when government officials cannot fulfill a simple commitment to respond to a memorandum, it sends a message that the lives of the majority poor, everyday people, will always be of low priority. Thank you, Honorable Chair. That is the end of our presentation. Ms. Siopa, thank you very much. Um, can I then uh, uh, ask uh, Comrade Maitu Parks to, to come in from COSATU? Chairperson, sorry, uh, section 27 is next. Section 27, I'm, I'm, I'm rushing. Um, section 27, please come in and uh, let's, <clears throat> let's hear from you and please uh, do the same, introduce yourself. Sure. Um, good morning, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members and attendees. I hope that you can hear me properly. Very well, um, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so my name is Matsidiso Lemwasa and I'm a budget researcher at Section 27. Um, so I'll be doing the oral submission for Section 27 um, on the Division of Revenue Amendment Bill. And yeah, we welcome the opportunity to do that. May I ask if our presentation can be um, shared or put on the screen so we can get started. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, slideshow. Um, can we make it the slideshow presentation mode? Thank you very much. Um, yes, so thank you. So yes, I've introduced myself. I just also want to note that Section 27 forms part of the Budget Justice Coalition. And so we're in largely in support of the previous presentation made by the Rural Health and Advocacy Project. So as Section 27, we are a public interest law center and we focus on the right to basic education and access to healthcare services. So that means our submissions, both our written and this oral one, will be centered on the rights to education um, and access to healthcare services through a gendered lens and particularly through the climate change context that we find ourselves in as a country. We submit that the Division of Revenue Amendment Bill has the power to advance human rights. Um, these rights in particular, unfortunately, it's characterized by real terms cuts to uh, funding in these areas, which erodes the real value. Um, it also the funding allocations do not keep up with the increasing lear learner enrollment rates and public healthcare user, um, user base. We also argue that the aggressive fiscal consolidation path that National Treasury has undertaken to stabilize debt has been at the expense of social spending areas. And we find that most the, the impact of this is most felt by the most marginalized people in the country. Next slide, please. 
Um, thank you. So overall, we recommend that Parliament considers whether these adjustments will allow the provinces and municipalities to provide uh, for the right to basic education and healthcare um, and perform their um, they're, you know, perform effectively. And we also call on Parliament to insist on human rights impact assessments. And what we mean by that is that if there are going to be cuts to social spending, they should be made um, based on a transparent and participatory human rights impact assessment, which demonstrates that these reductions will not exacerbate the inequality that South Africa faces, and they won't undermine our rights, um, people's rights to the access to quality, basic education, and healthcare services. Next slide, please. So the first area that we look at is the um, through a gendered lens, uh, the Division of Revenue Amendment Bill through a gendered lens. Uh, so we are concerned as Section 27 that while South Africa and many parts of the world face uh, phenomena referred to as the feminization of poverty, uh, where the gap between men and women who are in the cycle of poverty has widened, um, and the FFC recommends redressing this, this gender inequality using gender budgeting, and the president announcing at the G7 summit earlier this year that South Africa would incorporate gender responsive budgeting. Unfortunately, the Division of Revenue um, Amendment Bill has, not, has overlooked the gender implications and has not mentioned gender or gender responsive budgeting at all. More so, um, moreover, the provincial equitable share and conditional grants are not made in a gender responsive manner, nor are they reflected upon through a gendered lens. Uh, next slide, please. We recommend that Parliament requests National Treasury to provide evidence of how it has considered the FFC's recommendation for gendered budgeting and to request a robust plan um, on gender responsive budgeting over the, over the medium term and to insist on adequate resource allocation to the provinces so that they can effectively implement the national strategic plan on gender-based violence and femicide. Next slide, please. Um, so from our analysis of the Division of Revenue Amendment Bill, we have found that the provincial equitable share continues to be reduced in real terms, which contradicts the, M the finance minister's speech Then he said that the MTBPS would enhance the quality of education and healthcare services in the country. Um, no additional funding has been provided to the provincial equitable share, um, and meaning that this, the PES will only increase by 2.9% in nominal terms in this financial year, which is well below the inflation, the CPI inflation of 6.8% and does not account for the population growth of 1.4%. Next slide, please. This continues, uh, this downward spending continues into the next financial year, where we see even a nominal cut to the PES of 0.8%, which reduces the provincial equitable share to 556.4 billion rand. We argue that this is a form of blatant austerity, and it should be rejected because it will most certainly impact the quality of service delivery to what basic education and healthcare in the provinces, which contradicts uh, what the minister has said about the MTBP is ad advancing um, the quality of those services. Next slide, please. We then noted um, that the Division of Revenue Amendment Bill, uh, that in the Division of Revenue Amendment Bill, some conditional grants have kept up with CPI inflation, which we welcome. However, not all of them have. So overall spending on conditional grants has increased uh, by 6.8%. Uh, in this financial year to 123.7 billion rand, which is, while welcomed increases, these are well below the combined CPI inflation and population growth of 8.2%, and this trend only continues throughout the medium term. Next slide, please. So in the next financial year, 2023-24, there's a proposed nominal increase of only 3.5%, which is below the projected combined CPI inflation and population growth of 6.1%. So we recommend that con the conditional grants to provinces increase in line with both the, with the combined CPI inflation and population growth so that the real value is not eroded. Next slide, please. 
the conditional grants that we look at, so we explore the conditional grants in a lot more detail in our written submission, which I encourage um, uh, attendees to explore and and yeah and look at. Uh, but the first grant that we look at in our oral submission is the health facility revitalization grant, where it was earlier this year, section 27 noted with concern that they are uh, painful budget cuts that have been proposed to this grant in all but two provinces. And the two provinces that did not receive uh, cuts to the spending, the increases were below inflation. Unfortunately, since then, the Division of Revenue Amendment Bill has not made any provisions for upward adjustments to this grant. Um, this is even more concerning in the climate change context that South Africa finds itself in, um, as in KZN alone, 85 healthcare facilities were destroyed by the floods in April, and the Department of Health of the province reported that they received no additional funding from Treasury and had to reprioritize its own funding, its own 200 million that could have gone to other health priorities towards repairing um, these health facilities. However, the MTBPS and the Division of Revenue Amendment Bill do not recognize this damage, and the Health Facility Revitalization Grant unfortunately received no adjustment to its funding. And so we recommend that, next slide, please. We recommend that there should be either ring-fenced relief that is granted so that the health facilities that are affected by the floods can be repaired, or the health facility revitalization grant should be adjusted upwards to account for the impacts of these extreme weather events in KZN, in the Eastern Cape, but also throughout the country. Um, next slide, please. So the district health program grant, the first areas we look at is HIV and TB. So we welcome the MTBPS's narrative on focusing on addressing the pandemic induced backlogs. However, we're concerned that this is not reflected in the adjustments in the Division of Revenue Amendment Bill as in the 2022-2023 budget, um, the HIV, TB and STI component will decline on average at 3.4% over the medium term. So earlier this year in the budget review for February 2022, the goal was set to retain 5.7 million patients on ARV treatment, on ARV therapy by the end of this financial year. However, this is unlikely to be met and the MTBPS, instead of adjusting allocation to um, equip the provinces to meet this goal, the MTBPS has revised this goal down to 5.5 million which we are concerned about. Um, next slide, please. So as section 27, we call for upward adjustments in the district health programs grant to equip the provinces to achieve the initial goal for HIV and AIDS, or the initial HIV AIDS and TB targets to protect those affected, the right to healthcare for those who are affected. Next slide, please. Um, similarly, on well, still on the district health program grants, the oncology section, the MTBPS also recognizes that the service there are extensive service backlogs in oncology and they need to be addressed. Unfortunately, we are concerned that the commitment to address these service backlogs is deferred to next year, to the next financial year, so the 2023-24 budget. Um, we're concerned that this may be too late for some of the patients who have been on the waiting list to receive radiation oncology services for years. Um, next slide, please. The next grants we look at are the education conditional grants. So the first one being the education infrastructure grant, the EIG. So section 27 welcomes the additional funding of the EIG to repair schools that are affected by floods, uh, particularly in, the, in KZN and the Eastern Cape. Um, and we welcome this emergency relief. However, our analysis has so shown that this might, this 116.8 million might not be sufficient to repair all the schools. Next slide, please. So a progress report by the Auditor General found that in KZN alone, 356 schools needed repairs and these repairs cost just over 235 million rand. However, this 116.8 that has been allocated will only be enough to support 177 projects that um, at flood impacted schools. 
So we recommend and call on increased allocations to the EIG to support all disaster struck schools in the country. Next slide. Thank you. Um, we then looked at the Early Childhood Development Grant and welcomed the MTBPS's commitment to increase the fund to allocate increased funding so that we can improve and expand ECD services in the country, particularly as the function shift has moved this year to uh, the Department of Basic Education. However, the Division of Revenue Amendment Bill has not reflected any upward adjustments to the grant, which leaves the provinces in the same position and actually worse because the inflation rate has since um, increased since uh, February. Uh, so it leaves the, the provinces at a worse off position to subsidize ECD and construct the low cost pilot ECD centers um, proposed. And so we call on the Division of Revenue Amendment Bill to reflect this, commit, um, this commitment to improving ECD services through increasing the ECD grants um, in the country. And then next slide, please. Uh, the last education grant we look at is this National School Nutrition Program grant, uh, the NSNP, and we welcome two areas of this. We welcome the expansion of the NSNP to learners um, in, Quintel, in some Quintel 4 and 5 uh, schools because of the increasingly depressed economic conditions that many uh, families in the country face. Um, and we also welcome the over, over the medium term that this grant is increasing in line with inflation. However, we recommend that the NSNP be at minimum linked to the food inflation rate rather than the CPI, because the food inflation, the food price inflation over the past year has been 11.3%, which is well above the CPI. And if food prices increase at a similar rate over the next three years, the NSNP may not be adequately funded to carry the cost of meals to all qualifying learners. Um, last slide. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity and for the audience and looking forward to any feedback. My contact details are on the slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ms. Matsidiso. Uh, I think now it's a, 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 a Kosatu, a Comrade Pax. Let you please come in. Okay. Um, good morning, Chair, and thanks to Chair to give us a chance to, to raise our views at Kosatu. Good morning, members. And you um, remember, you remember that you donated your five minutes to Salva? Yes, yes, yes. We were, we were very revolutionary. Uh, um, <laughs> but uh, we might extract our demands in exchange for the for Salga's pilfering of our five minutes per uh, comment chair. Um, <laughs> no, no. So thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, no, thanks, members, for giving us space as Kosato just to raise our views. Um, I think from us, you know, that we look at the MTBPS from a context of a 44% of a unemployment rate, um, you know, youth unemployment rate of 60%. We have an economy which is stagnant. We have inflation, which is at quite a high level for, for many, many years. And of course, rising levels of poverty and inequality. And of course, Chair, we're seeing the real impacts upon a decade of state capture and corruption um, on the capacity of the state to deliver quality public services. Uh, we are very worried about the rising public debt levels, but equally the need to, to rebuild the state. And of course, you know, load shedding, the need to support ESCOM is critical if we, re if we are to rebuild the economy. Um, equally, we are worried about the impact of uh, cable theft on transnet and metro rail, the economy. And of course, there is a need to repivot our SOEs, but we're also quite worried in terms of the dollar bill. Um, and it's a pity we didn't hear from Salga what their views but a huge ra rapid rise in the number of distressed municipalities. And of course, I think we are appreciative of the responses to an extent um, in the daughter bill to try to respond to the, to the floods in 2022. Um, Chair, just to highlight some contextual issues before I get into the daughter bill. Um, we do feel the rapid rise in public debt is really an existential threat to our national sovereignty, um, the post-1994 gains, um, and the many rights that workers have won. Um, we are quite concerned, as other colleagues are, with the uh, below CPI increases to key departments, uh, municipalities over the MTEF, and what is the impact upon service delivery? We think it's going to worsen situations. So we think the focus by Treasury colleagues, and whilst we understand the need to manage the debt, but we think the focus on solely slashing expenditure to cut debt 
at the expense of stimulating the economy, of providing relief and rebuilding quality public services is not going to resolve the fiscal crisis. Uh, we think we actually need to tackle the real cause of the fiscal crisis, which is a recession, corruption, limping SOEs, et cetera. Chair, we think it would be, we know colleagues are going to ask us about the public service, public sector wage bill, um, and including the municipal wage bill. Uh, but we want to say, as, you know, as, as, as a union movement, we, we think we must reject the tendency of government to dump the bill for corruption, for state capture, for mismanagement of the state and the economy, to nurses, to teachers, to municipal workers. Um, if we're going to have a continuous repeated 0%, like in 2020 or below inflation increases, we are going to spark a brain drain from the public sector. Um, I think public servants and other workers are all highly indebted. We think the state really does need to respect collective bargaining, engage in good faith and see how do we find a compromise, which is win-win. But I think workers are correct to expect to have their wages um, being protected from inflation. We think there is ways to help the state to save costs. You know, for example, having a single collective bargaining processes for the state, for entities, SOEs, et cetera. But of course, if you want to sell the message of constraint or fiscal discipline to the public, to workers, then they need to see politicians leading from the front. You need to see senior state management as well, uh, taking wage cuts, not just simply imposing on, on, on workers. Um, so we are worried about the rapid decline in the headcount in the public sector. So just very quickly on the issue of revenue, I think we must really appreciate the work, excellent work being done by the workers at SARS to rebuild SARS, or to exceed its revenue targets, because that's giving significant cushioning for, for the MTPS, for the dollar bill, et cetera. And really does show you the value of investing in state capacity and the benefits that provides to the economy. Uh, we think we need to do more to reinforce SARS to build its capacity to tackle tax and customs evasion. Um, but of course, we would hope to see the end of increasing taxes upon workers and the poor. We think there is some space to look at taxes increases for the wealthy, and in particular around tax and customs evasion. Um, Chair, I think what kind of alarmed us, one of the things which alarmed us in the MTBS and the Dora Bill is that there was a really an absence of practical interventions around corruption. Um, you know, we do welcome the recent progress in arrests and sieges of, of persons accused of corruption in the assets. But if you look at the APP targets for the NPA, they're very, very far behind the targets. Equally, we've seen a real decline in the headcount of the police service um, over the past decade from 200,000 to 172,000. Um, we heard the minister talk about additional funds for law enforcement, but they didn't provide practical details. Um, but we want to support you know, the recent efforts to fast track the public procurement bill. And we want to also say, let's, if we want to tackle corruption, let's look at livestock audits uh, conducted by SARS for politicians, for senior states and municipal officials and, and the wealthy. Chair, just getting into the provincial government. Chair, so we appreciate we're six months into the financial year. Um, but if you look at all the provincial governments, all of them are roughly around 40% of the budget expenditure to date. And that might seem okay halfway through the year, but it does mean that we're going to see in January, February, March, fiscal dumping in a significant levels. And we don't think that's the correct way to manage scarce resources for the state. And also that's the correct way to, to, for an, to run an economy which is really needing stimulus. Um, Chair, just on the issue of local government, um, and it really is a little bit worrying that Salga and Cogta are just absolutely silent on the extent of the crisis in municipalities. We've seen in the past decade, an increase in financially struggling municipalities um, from 10% to over 90%. Oh, 10% of municipalities under administration. So there is a positive um, additional 40 billion rand to support local government in the MTPS, but there's no real practical details of what does it mean in practical terms? Who is it for? What is the expected outcomes? We don't see any real plans besides PowerPoints from Cogta and Salga about what has been done to halt the alarming rise in collapsing and collapsed municipalities, collapsed basic services. And there's a real cost to that. Uh, Chair, you would have seen, we would all recall that, you know, last year, um, Clover closed its dairy production facilities in Lichtenberg, um, in Frankfurt. And if you go to those towns, besides that, in the Salsa pay points, that's the economy. Um, so there's a real consequence to, to Salga and Cogta's neglect of municipalities, and that is workers who are losing their jobs as companies close. We think we need to have real practical plans about how do we begin to consolidate uh, towards a district development model. Chair, it's quite disappointing that Cogta and Salga and MTBS are absolutely silent about, there's about three dozen municipalities which at various uh, stages are not paying their workers on time. 
Um, we've seen this number of municipalities failing to pay workers on time as legally required, increasing at worrying levels. Um, and again, Cogda, Salga, silence. Um, now, Chair, previously members have asked me for which of these delinquent municipalities. So in terms of municipalities, which we're told by SAMU, a municipal workers union, um, municipalities which are owing workers salaries currently, um, in the free state is Kopanong, which is three months in salaries in arrears, it's Mohokare and Masoronyane. And again, Chair, it's quite alarming how Salga, Cogta, MTBS are just silent on this issue. Now we have another category of delinquent municipalities who deduct um, legally required deductions from your salary, be it a medical, be it pension, be it your UAF or your tax, et cetera, the variety of them, or the COIDA, et cetera. But they don't then hand it over to whom they're meant to give it to. So they take their pension money, they don't hand it over to the pension fund or medical, et cetera. So in the Eastern Cape, the ones who are owing or have not paid these statutory deductions, which they took, it's a Bayes Nordia, Makana, uh, King Dalinjebo, Oatambo, and Amatlati. We would recall Amatlati at once was paying workers with pick and pay vouchers. Um, in the same category of, of non payment of statutory deductions, we have in the Free State, again, the same three municipalities of Koponong, Mohokare, Masolonyane, and a, a new one of Mafube. Um, in the Northern Cape Chair, we have uh, four municipalities. Uh, I hope I get the name pronunciations correct. Kahaiska, Karib, Rolosterberg. But I want to mention Tembelife Chair because Tembelife is owing the pen, uh, more than one year's of deductions. Um, Tembelife is also the hometown of the Premier of the Northern Cape as well, the home municipality. In the Northwest, in the same group, we have uh, quite a few. Uh, Sobotla, Katleng, Mamosa, Mahikeng, which is six months in arrears, Naledi, and then Swaying, which is uh, in a category of its own, which is owing one year's worth of deductions, including pension funds. And you will recall many of these names, Comrade Chair members, because these ones, which are also where you're witnessing the collapse of basic services, where you're witnessing often quite violent um, community protests and frustration. Um, and if you go to some of these municipalities, you will see that the roads, et cetera, sewerage are completely collapsing at all levels. So Chair, we think that one is to plead with Parliament. We really need to hold these offending municipalities, especially through the NCOP, um, to account. We also really need to hold Co Cogta and Salga accountable because the silence cannot be justifiable. Chair, the payment, non-payment of medical, of your statutory deductions, your medical, your pension, et cetera, those are criminal offenses because we've taken the money from the workers, we've not handed it over. Equally, the non-payment of salaries also is tantamount to theft. And we think those who are responsible it's about time they'd be arrested and charged for fraud, but we shouldn't be continuously making workers uh, the victims of corruption, of state capture, mismanagement, and underfunding. Uh, there has to be some action um, if we're to hold this situation. Chair, on the issue of the flood relief, I think we do want to welcome the different revenue adjustments, trying to assist uh, to repair the damages caused by the floods in KZN and Eastern Cape, as well as other floods in the Northwest and the Western Cape. So I don't think I need to go into the details of the floods too much, but I think, you know, um, the different allocations to the disaster fund, to local government, to emergency housing, uh, municipal relief, inform upgrades, I think those are quite welcome. Again, Chair, I think, you know, the efforts given to try to assist KZN in particular, around emergency shelters, infrastructure for school repairs, road repairs, uh, flood relocation, those are welcome. Again, a similar uh, support given to the Eastern Cape for schools, for roads, for infrastructure, I think those are positive. Um, and I think similarly to chair the efforts to, to assist the Eastern Cape and Lumpopo on the repairing of bridges damaged by floods, uh, similar efforts to the Northwest, to the Free State and the Western Cape. So I think chair, all of those are fine and they're positive and I think that one appreciates the efforts by government. But I think chair, what we're quite concerned about, and again, the MTPPS, these provinces, these departments, Salga, Cogda, are very silent on it, is the continuous reports that we've all seen um, in public about money is not reaching, reaching the provinces on time or municipalities on time. Uh, money that was promised ends up being something else. Um, we also see continuous reports and people on the ground about money not filtering down to, to affected persons or the families or communities, and that's quite worrying, Chair. We think government really has not been effective in communicating what relief was provided, um, how was it provided, to whom, and how to access it at times. And Chair, I think, you know, there might have been good efforts by government. We appreciate no one is ever properly prepared for a disaster. But you know, when you have a, a legacy of corruption and state capture, um, this really does feed into a culture of distrust, this poor communications. 
And of course, things are much are made much worse because we have a, an explosion of fake news over social media these days. So there really is a need for government, for GCIS, for national, provincial, and local government to really communicate things properly um, so people can have a sense, a sense of trust, et cetera. I think just getting to the end, Chair, I think other issues I won't cover it so much because they go to the preparations round of engagements. But I think we're really at hope to see significant increases to the presidential promise stimulus, uh, especially that could help at a provincial or local level to employ young people, give them practical skills, et cetera. Chair, I think we're, you know, we had supported the infrastructure program because it felt critical to rebuilding state capacity, to growing the economy, to absorbing unemployed persons. But it's quite worrying how far behind we are with regards to the infrastructure rollout. We are targeted 1.6 trillion. I don't think we've even made 10% of that. Um, that is quite worrying. And again, local government is critical in that regard, especially on issues of water, of roads, of generation, et cetera. Chair, I don't think you need to go into desolation programs too much, but just for the benefit of members, we just highlighted it because we think that's key to, to growing the economy. Um, and again, Chair, the issue of departments will raise, just share with members for the benefit, but we'll raise it in the population round of hearings. Um, same with the economic and social relief measures too, just for members' benefits, and we'll raise it in the appropriations. Chair, just lastly, I think on the issue of ESCOM. So I think it, it belongs in appropriations, but I think just because the colleagues from Salga have raised it, so we do support efforts by government to rebuild ESCOM is critical to the economy, to local government, et cetera. Um, we do welcome the commitment of my government to take up to two thirds of the ESCOM debt, but I hope it does not include a stripping of key assets for ESCOMs, uh, ESCOM itself. But Chair, we want to disagree with Salga to say that we must also include debt forgiveness for municipalities. ESCOM has been doing that. Municipalities have had constant debt relief agreements with ESCOM and have continuously failed to honor those agreements. It can't be correct that half of the country pays the electricity bills and the other half, in particular municipalities, some SOE, some businesses, just simply choose to ignore it. ESCOM's debt level for municipalities has increased from 40 billion rand in the past year to 51 billion rand, roughly. It's continuously rising and it's forcing ESCOM into a crisis where ESCOM now has to go for double digit 32% tariff hikes because municipalities choose to pay fast and loose with money that is often paid to them by consumers, by residents, by which municipalities then choose to sit on and not hand over to ESCOM. Chair, we, we appreciate municipalities are underfunded, as I conclude, but I think the real solution to, to avoid this kind of constant chasing of, of, of moving targets is for the entire country to simply move to prepaid electricity. For municipalities, for SOEs, for large businesses, that's the only way we're going to close this chapter on, on the debt issue. Um, Chair, I just won't go into these because it's appropriations issues. Um, so I think just Chair, in conclusions, I know I have to conclude, I hope I, I exceed my time too much. So there are positives in the MTPS, you know, the SOD grant, the ESCOM debt relief and the other issues, but we do think it does fail to address the fundamental crisis of facing the economy, facing issues of corruption, of rebuilding the state, of growing the economy. We don't see practical measures about halting the collapse of municipalities. Um, so Chair, I think for us, it's, it's a missed opportunity, but we hope in February, we will really see a, a bold budget, a progressive budget from, from Treasury, from government rather, and that will stimulate the economy and rebuild local government, et cetera. So I think, Chair, let me stop there and hope I didn't exceed, I think I might've exceeded the allocation I gave to, to Salga and the person. Oh, that's 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 perfect. Thank 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 you so much, uh, uh, Kosatu. Uh, honorable members, yeah, I'm back to you. Let me see by the show of hands, the honorable members would like uh, to uh, have a bite uh, on the issues that have been raised uh, 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 by the presenters. Thank you very much to all the presenters. Uh, we have taken time to uh, interact with the uh, with the with the committees. Let's let's see. Um, <clears throat> I I I I see Orabul Mletsane, please start and then followed by Orabul Sheikh Imam. I'll take it from there. Uh, Orabul Raida. After Orabul Mletsane, Orabul Sheikh Imam, Orabul uh, uh, Raida. In that order, thank you. Those are the hands that I see for now. Thank you, Chairperson. Good morning to everyone. Let me first start by acknowledging the presentations. Chairperson, my first question goes to Salga. Before that, let me apologize for not switching on my, my, my video. The network where I am, it is not good. 
Uh, on SALGA, what measures can be taken to assist municipalities to address the increasing inflation, which might take away the municipal revenues? My second question goes to Salga also. What is your comment on the issue of local government infrastructure network maintenance and local government, which also results in water being contaminated in certain areas? My last question, Chairperson, goes to National Treasury. I would like the National Treasury to comment on the issue raised by Salga around underfunding of local government approximately about a uh, local government approximately about 56 a billion. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Sheikh Imam, please come in. Yeah, thank you, Chairperson. I've got about 250 questions. I'm glad you chose Friday afternoon. So we'll continue to tomorrow <laughs> for some time. <laughs> but all right, let me let me just start off first of all. Uh, my first one, I think, is to Salga. Now, and I think I must agree with Kosatu. The question is, I mean, I think it's ridiculous, first of all, Chairperson, that Salga is asking for government for debt relief for the municipalities in order for the municipality to pay ESCOM. Really, rather than talking about strengthening revenue collection and ensuring there's greater accountability and better management skills put in local government, we are now asking Treasury to give them money to pay to ESCOM because they fail to manage their finances properly. That's the first thing. Now, the second thing is, what is Salga doing to ensure, and you raising correctly so, there is poor planning. Now, if you know that we are talking about introducing zero-based budgeting, and we all know that none of these local governments are prepared because all they're doing is this every year, adding one billion or two billion to their budgets and giving out these figures. When you give them money, come back to what Kosatu is saying, a lot of them are far behind in spending. You get fiscal dumping at the end. This is the norm. What is Salga doing about ensuring there is better collaboration between the people on the ground? If you hear and many of the other uh, 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 inputs that we've had are raising concerns about poor health down at local government level, water problems, sanitation problems. They're talking about these things. But Salga has a role to play. What is Selga doing to improve the quality of services, the quality of the capacity that we have in these local governments? Uh, and, and more importantly, to deal with the high levels of corruption. I come back to my stock record chairperson on value for money. If Selga tells me that they don't know that corruption is rife at local government level, then I think they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. So I'd like them to tell me what is being done if you look at the poor state of the coalition governments, if you look at the people that are being employed in these in, 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 in this municipalities, every year the Auditor General is giving findings, adverse findings against the local government. No consequences whatsoever. What pressure is Salga putting on all the stakeholders to ensure there's greater accountability? And things? Yes, you are correct when you're talking about housing, sanitation, and electricity. Now, let me go on. Let's talk about water and sanitation. Does Selgon not know that the process of providing water through water tankers is the, is, is the root of a lot of the corruption in water and sanitation? Where is the motivation to deal with infrastructure when people are making money out of these water tankers? And we knew even at stage during the, the when we were having a problem with water, how we were being invoiced for these water tankers that were never, ever being delivered. Let me talk about farming communities in all these local governments. Has Selga ever considered talking to farm owners together with the municipality, making it a win-win situation for farm workers? It is not acceptable to expect farm owners to continue accommodate people on the farm after people have retired. Has Selga ever considered that to create an environment that when people retire, 
the municipality will have a home for them so that they can move there. Financial distress. What is Salga doing, Chairperson, in ensuring that some of these municipalities, uh, uh, through giving incentives, attracting businesses, uh, a small business development in it to become more uh, financially stable, and rather than rely totally on, on handouts. Now, I think I'll, for, I'll stop with Salga for there because there's so many others to, to go there. But lastly, I just want to touch on the statement that's being made even by the president, where you want to shut out. Let's look at Pumalanga. That power station that is being shut down, okay, over 100,000 indirect jobs are going to be lost. All these mining towns will become ghost towns. Where is Salga's input into that to try and protect this? Minister Mantasha says, no, we cannot shut them down. But others are saying something else. So where is Salga coming in as far as uh, 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 that's going? Now, I want to talk about the next one, which is rural health. And yes, you are correct in identifying some of the challenges we have. But I want to urge you, it's more of a recommendation. You know, we need to talk about being self-sufficient and not enough is being, because I think we lack vision. One of the problems we have, even with, with the NHI being rolled out successfully, we cannot attract healthcare workers, general practitioners to the rural area. Don't you think we should be starting a process to ensure that rural towns identify graduates and those already in higher education, in, 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 in basic education, but grade 10, 11, and 12, with the necessary capacity, and identify them and ensure that in the longer run, through those that we have identified, we ensure that we have local capacity in the rural areas so that you don't rely on people or experts or healthcare workers uh, migrating to rural areas. They're not willing to do that because we cannot afford to keep them there. We cannot provide them safety and security. We cannot provide them uh, with the necessary benefits that they need. So identify them at a very early stage. Maybe we need to introduce something like that together with basic education and things. So that will perhaps go a long way. And I think you, 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 you talk about the amount of money. Now, I'm a little bit concerned, Chairperson. I know many people are saying, take from the rich and give the poor. And I'm not defending the rich. But Chairperson, only 13% of these people in this country pay taxes. And yet there's billions of rands in illicit financial flows that are leaving the country. There is thousands of people conducting business in this country, Chairperson. Through these, even these local municipalities, there is no coordination between local government, between SARS and the uh, municipality that gives them license to ensure that all these people are accountable, pay a vet, pay taxes and things. It's not happening. So you cannot continuously expect the rich to just pay for the poor. What is going to happen is, is that these people, these middle class and rich, and you saw many of those skills, are leaving the country because they are fed up. We are one of the only countries in the world where only 13% of the people pay tax. And it is because of our failed policies that we're finding ourselves in the situation uh, 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 we are in. And the other important thing is, is we're not getting that value for money. At local government level, it just does not exist. On the issue of TB, I want to just touch very quickly, Chairperson, and I know I might be taking too much of time. Have we, do we agree that it is the socioeconomic conditions under which we are living Poor housing, poor water and sanitation, high levels of poverty, people are unemployed. That is giving rise to the number of people with tuberculosis and other non-communicable diseases. What are we going to be able to do there to be able to? So that is why we say we need a more holistic approach. And let me tell you, giving grants and grants and grants, and that's to my other colleague at Moby, I understand what you're saying. You cannot survive in 350 rand. You go to a supermarket today. You're coming back with nothing in your basket and your 350 and you are correct. But we need to create a conducive environment to get people to be more productive. You, this country cannot sustain paying more grants and grants and grants. Yes, we can give it to the indigent people and the old age people, but we need to create an environment to create more and more jobs in this country so people can be more productive. I always say rather earn 2,000 rand a month than not earning at all than taking 350 rand grants. And also you need to look at something else. We're giving a lot of these grants. Did you know these grants do not even reach those beneficiaries? Many of these children, there's no mechanism to even ensure that they're going to school. If you talk about the socioeconomic, we need to get to the grassroots of what is happening. Why is there so many dysfunctional families? Why is the high crime rate so high? 
what can we do how can click it in the button early stage all right chair i'm going to finish up sorry chair all right i won't go to the others i'll give them a break but just to kosato i just want to know and thank you for some of your presentation just one question i want to know what is the unions in this country i heard the other day 400 million rand somebody had in the bank lucky they only took 50 grand from the account what is the unions themselves doing to ensure a more productive society investing in 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 people in the country to create jobs they may be i'm not aware of it i read it every media i don't find it what is the unions doing what are they worth in this country what are they putting back into the economy i've got many other questions but uh, would restrictions with time thank you chairperson thank you for the opportunity thank thank you honorable uh, uh, sheikh imam uh, honorable right at least come in yes uh, good morning chairperson good morning everybody thank you for the for the presentations today and the opportunity to to ask questions um yeah i'm not feeling very well at all because i'm finding i'm agreeing very much very strongly with most of what mr sheikh imam said uh, which is unusual but uh, nonetheless <laughs> i think his, his points were excellent uh, so so well done on that and he's covered a lot of what i wanted to say but i also have a lot to say so my first point is that i i share selgas concerns about the distribution of of funding and and the disproportional distribution of funding uh in the division of revenue that goes towards uh, national government and we've been on or i've been on about this for some years and i know that my 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 colleagues my from my party that represented the, us on these committees in the past have been on about it before i got here and the 9% is just not enough uh, for local government but also the the proportion that's given to provincial government is also insufficient and there's certainly there's a, there's an impression out there treasury that what happens is that uh national government takes what it needs and then whatever's left over uh kind of the scraps go towards provincial and local government and this is borne out to to a quite a high degree uh in the adjustment uh th that we're dealing with right now and the fact that that provinces share um of of funds goes down quite substantially um in 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 terms of what's what's happening now with the increased uh, payments towards national departments um what's even more alarming is the fact that a lot of the money that 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 uh, is being shown as going to local and provincial government is actually not because it's uh, it's in indirect grants um, that are given down so it's actually money that's still managed by the national department even though they uh, you know uh, using province as a conduit for the spending um it's entirely under national government's control so i'm very concerned about that and the fact that you know the intergovernmental fiscal relations bill says that 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 there must be a you know reasonable equity in the distribution and and i i want to reiterate what i said there's a strong perception out there that money is given to national departments and then if there's anything left it gets given to provinces and and local that's something that uh, i'm going to continue fighting about and we are going to uh to pursue going further having said that i do think that um Mr. Mr. Sheikh Imam was quite correct in saying that you know local government has not covered themselves in glory um and have shown them to themselves to be fiscally imprudent so you know do you want to entrust local government with additional funding the reality is that there has to be a change somewhere that happens um and local government needs to start taking more accountability uh for for their financial behavior because in reality they've got a lot of fun, unfunded mandates that have been thrust down on them and particularly Sheikh Imam uh Mr Sheikh Imam mentioned the the issue around the housing but with the land invasions that are happening now and the substantial cost that is pushed down particularly on the urban municipalities that are facing massive influxes uh of of, of people coming in and looking for job in these hard jobs in these hard times um you know that that unfunded mandate of providing houses uh providing services to people in an unplanned manner uh has put local government under massive massive pressure perhaps selga can also talk to us a little bit about the budget forum one of my bugbears because we always hear uh that you know there's been a budget forum and there's been space created between treasury and local government to talk um and then we have complaints 
consistently through the rest of the year um, that uh, you know local government is unhappy. Uh, what's happening at that budget forum? Why is there such an unequal outcome to it that uh, that that local government feels the need to complain about the outcomes for 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 eleven and a half months of the twelve? Um, Rural Health came up with quite an interesting proposal, and I spoke about a joint sitting with departments um, to try and understand, for us as a committee, certainly, to try and understand, you know, the amounts that are going to the various departments. I think it's actually a very useful discussion. They pointed out health, but I do think that, uh, you know, as we consult with with, with, with public stakeholders, um, you know, perhaps it would be useful for us to call for inputs as well and perhaps offer departments a chance to have a 20 minute presentation to this committee. Um, I do know that the, the Defense Department has been calling for this for quite some time uh, because I sit on, 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 on some of their meetings with the Joint Standing Committee. So um, I think it is an interesting thing and perhaps something for our chairs and our, our, our programming people to, to consider going forward. Let's give uh, departments a chance to come and present to us um, and, and, and tell us why they feel that they deserve more of the of the fiscus. Um, yeah, TB Health concerns around uh, wage bill, crowding out uh, actual delivery and, and the data. Amandla Moby, I think, well done on your, your technology today. Your, your presentation was slick and very useful. Again, uh, whether we agree with all the content or not doesn't matter. I think it was a good presentation. And we certainly agree the 350 Rand uh, is insufficient. But big concern about the fact that there's underspending on that and perhaps that the um, the barriers to qualification are, are, are not working properly. I don't think that's a treasury issue. I think that's probably got more to do with the Department of Social Development. But I think certainly we, we share your concerns about that not getting to its intended beneficiaries. Uh, Section 27, well, all they did was point out why the NHI is not going to work if it ever gets implemented because of the uh, the problems in the health system. And then my last point, Chair, and, and it goes to Kasatu. Thank you very much, uh, as always, for the work that's gone into your presentation. But I wanted to pick out on this issue of the non-payment of statutory deductions of, of people's staff, uh, salary at the end of the month, and the fact that this is not being paid over as it should. Chair, this needs to be taken on in a very serious light because it's criminal that Payments to medical aids, payments to um, to the tax authorities are not being made by municipalities in spite of the fact that are made to authorities by municipalities in spite of the fact that they deducted off staff members uh, salaries at the end of the month. And the fact is that you're leaving people unprotected. People are unable to get a tax clearance certificate in order to, to, to do whatever they need to do. But worse than that, if you're medical aid is unpaid and your medical aid lapses that leaves you and you and your family unprotected chairperson this is a criminal act of neglect and needs to be followed up in the harshest manner uh, municipalities where this is happening need to be taken under immediate administration uh, and there must be serious consequences uh, for both the executive and the administration uh, in those future Thank you, Honorable Ryder. Uh, Honorable Mlenzana, please come in. Uh, no, thanks, Chairperson. Chairperson? Honorable, Honorable Mlenzana, please come in. Honorable Njadu, I, I acknowledge you. I'll, I'll call you when you must come in. No, thanks, Chairperson. Uh, you know my challenge. That's why I was checking if uh, you can hear me. I am in that spot. So can you please bear with me that I don't open my video? No, thanks, Chairperson. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Uh, my, my questions, comments are not in order, Chairperson. They are, because as I've been listening, I was uh, just, you know, picking up some notes. Let me start with Amanda Mobi. In fact, let me welcome all presentations uh, for a start. I welcome all presentations and uh, they are well uh, to us as uh, the committee. They are going to assist us. Though some of the presentations, in fact, some aspects in the presentations 
are more of a repeat issues. I'm generic with this one. Uh, but 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 it's good that uh, these presenters keep on hammering up until something gets done. Then let me focus on Amanda Mopi. Uh, this is the question I once asked, but now I'm putting it the other way around, Jefferson, to Amanda Mopi. Uh, Amanda Mopi, what is your take on the expansion of uh, the tax base so as to cater for the constant plea of uh, the rise in, in the grants? That is, that is the first question. And the two, also to Amanda Mopi. Uh, what, what is the view of Amanda Mopi in terms of a creation of a welfare state? Uh, would they like to see South Africa being a welfare state or what? Then come to Salga. Salga Chepesin uh, is talking about the uh, structural underfunding, uh, which I listened carefully the articulation and uh, I'm not disputing. However, a, a one would have loved to, to listen when Salga is talking about uh, the perennial understanding by municipalities, uh, which goes on to fruitless and uh, wasteful expenditure. I would have loved to, to, to listen to Salga talking about those three. That's perennial understanding, fruitless and, and, uh, and uh, wasteful expenditure. Uh, oh, oh, my colleague, uh, Honorable Sheikh Man has spoken about corruption. I don't want to, to put my finger on it. Then the second one would be to Salga. What role does Salga play as far as municipal in-year monitoring is concerned. Uh, does Salka get shocked uh, at the end of the financial year like all of us? Or is Salka playing a role throughout the year? And if Salka is playing a role throughout the year in terms of in-year monitoring in municipalities, what is it that Salka is doing? Can they share with us experiences? Uh, when now we are talking of the 43 municipalities which are, you know, unable to perform on their own. And then on, on uh, Salga also, on the municipal debt to ESCOM. Uh, I'm putting a question here, unlike Honorable Sheikh Imam, but uh, to me it's a, it's a, it's a question, Chair. Uh, Salga, don't you think that? Uh, money for assisting uh, ESCOM, as you are saying, should be one way debited, one way or the other debited from uh, municipalities. What this I mean, Chairperson, is that treasury allocation to municipalities should be redirected, that portion which uh, municipalities are owing to ESCOM should then be redirected straight to ESCOM, not go via the municipalities because municipalities end up not paying the dues to ESCOM as per treasury allocation. Uh, this same applies to the municipalities which uh, are owing uh, the auditor general uh, fees, the audit fees due to the Auditor General of South Africa. Uh, if, if also Salka could uh, say something around that. You know, Chair, I'm very passionate when it comes to, to, to AXA. Then lastly to Kosatu. Yes, uh, Comrade Matthew, let me uh, appreciate the presentation and I am agreeing with you fully. But uh, what, what's your take uh, as Kosatu? Uh, in terms of synchronization of budgets, 
uh, the national, provincial, and uh, the local government budget. I, I hear you talking about fiscal dumping and all and all and all. Do you think that if budgets were synchronized uh, same time when we are talking of the budget here, it would be the same for national, province, and local? Would we see these uh, loopholes that you were raising happening? Thanks, Chairperson, and sorry for your time if I took long. Thanks. No, that's 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 fine, Honourable uh, Nenzana. Thank you very much, and uh, uh, keep on marking that spot. It, uh, it was very user friendly. We had everything that you raised. Uh, Honourable Kaiso, please come in. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Honourable Chair. Um, I, I tried to switch on my video, but it's like I. It's not in a good position. Allow me to switch it off. Uh, uh, let me thank um, all the presenters uh, uh, this morning, and they've made a very good presentations. Uh, now, I just want to, I, I'm trying to be short this time, uh, Chair. Uh, uh, perhaps you would know the, the reason why I, I today grow very short. <clears throat> uh, on the rural health project, I just want to get uh, your, 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 your view uh, with regard to NHI, because right through the presentation, I didn't get uh, clearly uh, what is your take in as far as the, the the, the NHI you know, is concerned because I, I, I should believe that this is a uh, one policy that would want to, you know, uh, advance the health of, 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 of our poor people. So I thought perhaps you would uh, budge on that uh, instance uh, uh, where NHI has come in, you know. And then uh, on section 27, Chair, I think some of the recommendations that section, uh, no, no, Amanda to, uh, Moby has made, uh, they are brilliant. And I think some uh, have been said previously in the previous uh, public hearing. Uh, so the issue of, you know, looking at how in future, the issue of 350 rand uh, uh, can be merged into, you know, into something that is tangible, uh, like basic income grant, you know. Uh, it can go a long way, uh, I agree with them. Uh, perhaps that, that needs to be fast-tracked and, and see to what an extent uh, uh, this can be, you know, uh, be actually finalized to look in the context of big, because that's what we uh, uh, the issue of social wage uh, comes in you know, uh, to intervene uh, in the in the situation of, uh, of 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 poverty. So so I think it can work very well. And uh, thirdly, is on the issue that has been raised on on the wealth uh, tax to tax the rich. Uh, I think uh, this matter is, is you know, it's, 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 it is always in the agenda. And uh, that Moby has raised this, and I know to an extent, Kosatu has also put it in his presentation, uh, the issue of taxing the rich, uh, that it has to be looked into. And I think there's there's a lot of money that can be you know uh, SARS has to look into uh, you know and put that into the tax regime. You can raise a lot of money so that the poor you know can uh, also have their share from that rich uh, richness. So, and on the on rural health project. Uh, was it rural? I think rural health project raised something on the uh, no again section twenty seven the issue of gender budget uh, chair. 
Recently, there has been a summit uh, on, on, on gender-based violence. And uh, of course, a number of other seminars and, and, and very important meeting which are discussing gender-based violence. But I think it's high time because it is it was not it is not set for uh, for the first time the issue of gender-based uh, uh, budget because it, it is going to be very critical up until we realize that now there is a need to have gender budget something that can be a resource that can be able to you know uh, uh, finance the, 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 the program of gender, not to depend on some slice, uh, small slice from, you know, uh, other program, but at least if within uh, the treasury budget uh, in future, there is that portion which really deals with the gender-based budget, we will see improvement in as far as fighting gender-based violence. Uh, but so long as that we do not give any attention to gender-based uh, based budgeting, we will see perpetuation of this gender-based violence because we will not have sufficient resources to can deal with that. So I want to agree with that uh, 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 that uh, that has been you know, suggested there uh, as a proposal. Then on Salga, uh, Honorable Chair, uh, we have dealt previously with the issues which are related to capacity, hence the issue of underspending, you know, uh, that you would see in some of the municipalities uh, that my honorable colleague has spoken about, Honorable Nezan. So it has now become a broken record, the issue of capacity. Obviously, this lack of spending or underspending, uh, it goes with the capacity and you know and skills that is involved uh, 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 underskilling there. And this matter has been uh, spoken about for quite a long time. Uh, why I'm saying about that, uh, talking about that, it is because we have even seen now, to a greater extent the deterioration in as far as management of finance of the municipalities as the auditor has picked it up, which included non-payment of workers. Uh, and it has repeatedly happened. I don't know to what an extent uh, did Salda assisted in that area, you know, because it's very brutal to see workers being butchered in that manner, whereas they have worked for, for, for all the days. And at the end of the day, uh, they get disappointed uh, by authorities not you know, effective salaries, uh, uh, salaries that they've worked for. So I don't know what to what an extent has the Salga come into that space, uh, which uh, is really worrying. Uh, that it has happened perpetually, you know, uh, which means there's something that cannot be uh, mastered at the local of municipality, which has resulted, you know, uh, in a cycle uh, to that what Kosato has, has explained that is non-payment of statutory deduction and all those things. It's, it's either there's capacity or something that is happening there which was not supposed to have happened because people shall have been exposed to management or finance of the local municipality that they would not necessarily have to go that route that no it's better to uh, run sunk the salaries of workers uh, uh, and then they must go starving and not coming to work not you know all those problems uh, complicates and, and, and complicates so I, I just wanted to understand from Salgano what is what has been your role in that in that aspect? And then, uh, yes, Kosatu, as usual, has made a very you know uh, excellent uh, uh, recommendation. Chair, of which I think uh, <clears throat> some of these recommendations, uh, honourable chair, they must find themselves in the respective areas of, or even at different committees 
where it is necessary, we recommend them to go uh, to see. We must find a way how do we see this recommendation you know, in, in some of the areas where they're supposed to be uh, integrated, uh, even, even when it comes to you know, uh, planning of the departments, uh, some of these recommendations, they must be seen to be you know, integrated in a way so such that we find them working. And I agree with uh, 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 COSATU recommendations. And then uh, uh, with the post office, uh, you see this, uh, we, 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 we- Honorable Taiso, find up. Okay, yes, on, on, on post office, uh, Chair, we, when, <coughs> The issue of post office, uh, we, we shouldn't, we're, we're not supposed to be seeing this, what is unfolding at that uh, level of the post office, where uh, almost a total of about 6,000 workers are uh, about to lose their jobs. Because our policy says we, we, we must protect the jobs. Uh, so we, 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 we cannot talk in contradiction uh, to, to that. So I think it's very important that it, that matter has to be looked into. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Kaiso. Honorable Jati, please come in. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairperson. Um, Good uh, day to the joint uh, committees um, and also to uh, the stake, all the stakeholders. Uh, Chairperson, let me let me uh, also um, welcome the, the 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 views, the inputs from from all the different uh, stakeholders. Um, Chairperson, um, let me first say that. Um, I, I think the committee uh, should uh, welcome uh, the the the, in, the the inflation increase on in, in on equitable share um, for for the 2023-2024 the MTEF period uh, as it was uh, one of the concern in the previous budget. And that is the first point, Chair. And then uh, let me then start uh, to then also uh, commend COSATU for the, their presentation was very clear. And, uh, and I want to fully to agree with the recommendations of, Cons of COSATU. Um, then Chairperson, um, let me then go to Amanda. Uh, Chairperson, I think we, we are coming a long way with uh, Amanda and um, processes being unfolded since nine, 2019. And um, uh, regards to the submission, uh, I, I think uh, Chair that National Treasury must, must provide a response. Uh, because the, the committee, um, as the also the finance committee on the uh, fiscal framework, also proposed that this matter to be um, addressed, and uh, also that the committee has to raise the issue around basic income grant. I, I think this matter uh, will be ap appreciated if. Uh, National Treasury can respond on this matter. Uh, Chair, and then um, on Salga, I think I want to reiterate the, the point raised by, by Honorable Melenzana on the vice versa, uh, who owns who. But in this case, on Salga, how would the ESCOM, there's a question, how would the ESCOM bail, bail out address the issue of municipalities owning ESCOM? 
and what specific measures can be taken to address this. So it's a matter of um, municipalities owning ESCOM and and as a vice versa in terms of this matter, but in terms of the bailout to ESCOM, I want uh, 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 Salga just to give us uh, clarity on that matter. Then, um, Chairperson, uh, 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 um, I think the committee should welcome, um, uh, let me, on, on Salga, let me again on Salga Chair. On Salga, with regards to disaster relief response, on yesterday's presentation, Chairperson, we, 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 we got the, the, in terms of how funds are being shifted from prov province to local, from local to province, in terms of making sure that funds are available at the provincial level and funds are available at a local level. Now, I want to, to ask this question to Salga. As National Treasury is ensuring that funds are available, um, in terms of the response of local government, what is the role of local government to ensure that, that there is a, a, a prompt response to the poor South Africans when disasters happened? Uh, Chairperson, we, we, we have seen the struggle of people being displaced by disasters from their homes, where a municipal official makes one visit and promise people assistance and never came back. Now the question is, Chairperson, how can Salga make sure that this is not happening at the municipal level? Because we, and from a national treasury perspective, funds are ensured to be available at the, at the, at the, at the relevant departments or provinces and municipalities. But the response, I think, is a challenge and people continue to suffer after disasters. Chairperson, I think um, the last one I want to raise also uh, the to uh, 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 health advocacy. Um, the, 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 the point I want to make here, Chair, is that why could, we, why could we not strengthen the existing oversight structures instead of creating more, which might later cause confusion? So I think I just want to raise that question to, 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 to uh, uh, um, TB advocacy. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. I think uh, that is the questions that I wanted to raise. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Honorable Njadu. Uh, let, let me take this opportunity to welcome all the presentations and also welcome the, 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 the comments by the Honorable Members on a number of things. And we'll be, request, we'll be requesting um, <clears throat> We'll be requesting a response, but before I, I, I do that, um, let me start. Honorable uh, Masang uh, asked me to raise some questions, which which I will do, and uh, then I'll have my uh, my my questions uh, af after that. Uh, the the first question is a. Uh, <clears throat> On RHI, uh, the Rural Health RHAP, um, the first question that uh, Honorable Mashang was asking is uh, uh, with regards to this proposed uh, committee, where would they derive their legislative power? And whether the committee would not be the duplication of what we already have? Salga, with regards to disaster relief response, what is the role of local government uh, in ensuring that there's prompt response to the poor South Africans when disasters happen? We've seen the struggle of the people being displaced by disasters from their homes, where municipal officials make one visit and promise people assistance and never come back. It's, uh, it's, it's similar to the, uh, to the question that uh, was raised by Honorable Njadi. Salka's response, 
on the issue of local government infrastructure network maintenance at local level, at local level which also results in water being contaminated in certain areas. And this has been touched, but let me, let me throw it in on, on Salka, how would the ESCOM bail out address the issue of municipalities uh, owing ESCOM? What specific measures can be taken to address this? You know that there is a position that uh, uh, you, you put. Let me come to my, to my questions quickly. Um, I think the starting point is there's, there's this assumption that municipalities must raise their own uh, revenue. So um, <clears throat> what comes from the national raise revenue uh, through the division of, of revenue bill or and uh, <clears throat> conditional grants uh, is an addition to that, but I just want to check. This is this goes to Salka. Uh, <clears throat> what is the trend of consolidated revenue collection by municipalities? I don't even want the numbers. I just want to see the, the trend. Uh, is the trend uh, uh, going up or going down? <clears throat> and also, what is happening to the uh, to to the debt as it stands now? The second question is that when Copter explains underspending. One of the main items or reasons that they um, uh, present is the lack of transfer of, lo of local government equitable share because of non-compliance by municipalities. Just want to hear your, 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 your comment, Mr. Koki, on, the, on, on that one. And what is Salga and the municipalities doing about that? Again, to Salga, how much are you owed by national government, provincial government, and, 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 and business? Uh, I think this goes to advocacy and accountability consortium. Uh, uh, Ms. Sihe, you, you talk about um, you talk about TB notification is more of clarification. What exactly does that does that mean? Because you seem to have figures of TB notification not being done, but you have got figures. So please just 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 comment on that one and clarify for us. And again, uh, I would like to hear your comment on NHI progress or lack thereof. Then again, um, I just, if you, if you talk about health issues, mainly the delivery is at the provincial level. I just want to check uh, you, your interaction with the provinces as far as the issues that you have raised with the, 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 the committees. Do you interact with them? Um, what is your experience? And so on and so forth. I think this, this, this one has been raised by a, a special appropriations, a standing committee on appropriations. The question of a quote unquote a savings by a <clears throat> social development. And it didn't just end by those savings. Uh, I'm saying quote unquote because we don't think that real are savings. Uh, we saw that money being uh, taken back to national treasury and some of it going to, tra to, to transmit. Um, <clears throat> what should be done with that? Uh, we are uncomfortable, but we just want to hear from you what, what you think should be, uh, should be done. Kosatu, uh, what's your take on what is happening in the post office? Uh, I'm saying this because most of these uh, post offices went on, to, uh, on, on have got direct effect uh, on localities, but especially on rural economies. What do you think should happen around that? Again, the health of, of local government is by and large dependent on the business activities taking place in those local, uh, uh, on those municipalities. What do you think should be government stance on, on, on strategic private companies uh, who are experiencing problems? For instance, an example would be Tomat Juliet's in KZN, uh, which at the beginning of the week, 
we went to business rescue, but again, a, a number of refineries which are closing down. Uh, what, uh, and those are, are privately owned. What do you think the government and our strategic in local communities where they are in local uh, uh, economies? Uh, have you thought about that? The next question, again, uh, I want to, to, to have on this economic activity in these areas, because I think that's where our salvation is in terms of growing those economies and uh, again, providing job uh, uh, opportunities. What do you think, what do you consider to be critical for local government? I'm sure this is both for Saka and, 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 and uh, uh, Kosat. What do you think uh, uh, consider to be critical things that should be done by local government to effectively participate on ERRP? Kosat, I hear you saying that uh, amongst the companies where you say there's no, there's no support for spending, you mentioned metro rate. Are you aware that metro rate in the, in the previous year, they underspent by 14 billion rand? And that was not just uh, the first time, but we are, we, are, we are calling for more funds to it, uh, which talks to the point which you always make that money is not the panacea of all the problems that we're having. I, I, this is not a question, it's more of a comment, uh, honorable rider. Uh, it's, it's always an, 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 a matter which uh, I grapple with the, the effectiveness and the efficiency of our model of, the, of delivery as far as indirect grants are concerned. I think it's, it's definitely it's, it's something that uh, uh, we, we need to stay closer to as, as, as parliament. Is this the most efficient way of dealing with uh, 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 delivery, the indirect grants? Again, um, I think the Honorable, honorable Sheikh Imam and Honorable Ryder, the, 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 <clears throat> and some other members, the question of deductions for medical aids, the pensions, and the, the risk that this brings to the, first and foremost, to the people who have paid for these uh, services, for this, uh, <clears throat> but at the end of the day, that money is not at, at, at being uh, transferred to the, pen, to the pension companies or medical aid companies. It's a huge risk. Imagine what happens uh, when the person gets involved in a big accident, for instance, and you find that the pension has not been paid out. It doesn't, it just exposes uh, families first and foremost. But I, I think again, it exposes the state uh, uh, because I think the state can be sued for those things, whatever uh, come out of, of, of that. Let me allow you uh, to, to respond to the issues which have been raised uh, 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 by the honorable members. And I think let's, 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 let's follow the, uh, the, the structure that uh, we, we follow when you're presenting. So we'll start with uh, we'll start with uh, Salga. Please, uh, 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 in, in don't take more than fifteen minutes. Uh, I know there are many. That's what I'm saying. Don't take more than there are many questions which are directed to you. Please, can you try to get into them and uh, give as brief answers as possible? Salga. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Do you hear? Can I uh, uh, double? Yes, you are very audible, sir. Thank you. Proceed. Uh, Chair, am I audible? Yes, you are. Proceed. We can hear you. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Uh, my name is... Yeah, we, we are now muted. Yeah, you. thank you. We Chair, muted. I think we, we have a network issues. Yeah, you can switch off your video, Mr. Defali. Okay. Can, can can am I audible now, uh, Honourable Chair? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you, Mr. Tihale. Continue. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you very much to the committee to give us this opportunity. Um, as in, uh, I'm going to deal with it in two ways. I'm going to deal with all political issues, and where there are still uh, technical issues, I will allow Homoto to. Uh, mop up on them. Uh, on the issue that has been raised by the chair, because most of the chair almost summarizes uh, what uh, the committee was uh, raising generally. We want to start with the one of disaster because it's the one that I think has been a bigger challenge. We want to indicate that uh, according to e legislation districts, uh, in all municipalities or district areas where we don't have metros, they are responsible for disaster 
response, and they do have all of them, uh, as uh, indicated, disaster response teams, where which are supposed to have the necessary equipment uh, that are supposed to be used during disaster. And we encourage municipalities, in particular the district, to ensure that uh, they look into their peculiar situation so that their response and equipment are in relation to the kind of disasters which happened uh, uh, most of the time in those areas. And uh, most of the district indeed do respond correctly, even though there are still challenges in some. We also want to indicate, Chair, that when it comes to the question relating to uh, what we call the green drop status, um, uh, that relates to the water treatment centers that they are supposed to ensure that uh, the water that they get back to the rivers are indeed uh, at the level required by law. It, it, it does happen that from time to time due to capacity issues or, or in some instances uh, neglect, uh, it, it does happen that uh, indeed uh, sewer do spill into uh, 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 the rivers. And uh, with the kind of response that we have seen working together with the Department of Water and the Sanitation, I think we, we are uh, getting into a better state and there is a bit of improvement around that response time and response in general. When to the trend uh, Mr. Uh, in terms of revenue, let's start with revenue. Um, in, in, in recent years, Chair, Mr. Tihale. Mr. 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 to please help us and, 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 and come in. We'll, 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 we'll try, Mr. Tihale. Mr. Tihale, we're, we're definitely losing you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm then requesting Mr. Koto to come in. Um, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, yeah, it appears that Councillor Tihale is having a challenge uh, from where he's connected. I think he did indicate so. Uh, looking uh, into the impact of COVID period, uh, trends sorry. and the economic uh, outlook due to Honourable the level of uh, Honorable Tihale. Honorable Tihale. Honorable Tihale. Mr. Tihale. Uh, Councillor Tihale. You are cutting a uh, chairperson. Uh, employment that's what... that is taking place with the municipalities for customers, um, particularly your. Uh, uh, you are cutting. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, we are definitely struggling to hear you, uh, uh, Councillor Tihale. Can you allow okay. us to, to, to then help? At least we can hear you. All right. No, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, on, on the aspect as to the happenings at the uh, budget forum, uh, on the slide, one indicated that there has been a, a, a faster growth rate, uh, particularly in the uh, allocation of nationally raised revenue to the local sphere of government. Uh, we indicated that for 2022-23, it, uh, it's about 13.7%, which is far above inflation. Uh, uh, and then for the outer years of the MTF, uh, it's actually 6.9% and 5.9%, which are also above the other two spheres. So the happenings at the budget forum is that it's a direct result of the interface that Salga leadership has had uh, with the, with, with, at, at the budget forum that uh, all what we've been uh, lamenting over the years is essentially uh, getting Chapter done, been however, and, uh, we've not quite- When it comes uh, to that, yes. Um, uh, Mr. Mkoke? Yes, Chair. 
please, uh, can, can you phone Councillor Dekhal and say you, you have taken over because you are not hearing. We'll, gi we'll give you that uh, a few minutes. Just call him and say you are, we are now on the, on the platform because he just disappears. Yes. Yes. I will call him and then Mr. Mkoti can continue answering the questions. Okay, that, that's, that's perfect. Thanks, thanks, Humoto. Okay, thank you. Y yes. Uh, in indicating that, uh, in fact, that's what is happening, uh, and also the refinement, particularly in the local government equitable share formula, it's also as a result of the interface that happens at the, at the budget forum. The challenge is that, uh, notwithstanding, this structural fund underfunding comes from a very low base, and it is actually taking much time uh, for us to realize an ideal state. Uh, hence, uh, we are steadfast in our resolve in actually uh, raising same in, in every interaction that we have uh, with, 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 the, with the committee. Uh, in regards to the issues where the statutory returns are not paid over, uh, third party payments are not paid, paid over, uh, that is a, a symptom simply of uh, poor financial management, poor financial planning, and uh, it is illegal. There is nothing that uh, Salga can say or do to uh, sugarcoat that. Uh, however, as an institution, because these are our members, we have embarked on a financial sustainability roadshow, particularly for those municipalities that have uh, financial distress, they are unable to, to even meet their uh, obligations in the ordinary course of business. I think in the slide uh, from COSAT, it also even showed uh, Amasati, a local municipality, of which we've had an interface with the leadership of that municipality, wherein uh, Salga is uh, advising them on what to do, uh, curtailing expenditure in order to instill a proper financial management uh, practices uh, in dealing with the same. Uh, in, 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 in dealing with that, and uh, in respect of uh, capacity or lack thereof that leads to underspending, uh, there we've been as well a uh, consistent as Salga that appropriately skilled people, that is the right people for the job, must be appointed uh, for, for to, to, to do the, the job. Uh, in an instance where you are having a, a local government level, uh, inappropriately uh, skilled individuals uh, appointed into positions in which they do not qualify for. That leads to particularly instances of uh, incapacity in the discharge of those responsibilities. And uh, for all such instances, I mean, the law should take its course. Uh, similarly, it, as it relates true to the uh, uh, cancer of corruption, uh, Salga NEC has also been also consistent that the law enforcement agencies must do their job and let the law uh, take its course because it's items that uh, it's aspects that we cannot condone as local government because it's tarnishing uh, the image of local government. Uh, pertaining true to uh, ghost towns, uh, Salga has got a program, a small town uh, regeneration uh, program. Uh, in fact, that had started particularly in the Karu. Uh, funded by the EU. Uh, in 2014, uh, the very same uh, program was then rolled out after the pilot in the Karoo uh, region. Uh, where there are certain actually uh, improvements that uh, have been uh, cited now, where, wherein uh, it indicates that the depression that occurred due to uh, as a result of poor uh, economic infrastructure, it is on the rise. However, it might not be there, but there is improvement, particularly uh, in, in 2014, there was no uh, even a shopping center in 2022. Now there is a new shopping center in Amsterdam, which is a town in Pumalanga. Uh, there's also an informal trading infrastructure that has been set up. Uh, there is also a multi-purpose center that had been set, set up amongst a few examples uh, eight years later. Although it's not fast enough, but uh, it, 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 there is a program uh, in trying to alleviate what would happen in terms of the, of, of, of the small towns. Uh, in, in relation to, to what we are proposing relative, relative to the uh, 
what the minister indicated about the potential in the 2023 budget, what you will uh, elaborate on further uh, about the structuring of the uh, ESCOM debt. We are very well aware that municipalities uh, though that are owing ESCOM, because the owing of ESCOM is a result of a depressed economy. I mean, we've had the uh, COVID uh, uh, shutdown that has also further depressed the collection rate for municipalities uh, for the usage of electricity and other uh, utilities like your water, uh, etc. That has impacted negatively on the ability of municipalities to actually pay over either the water boards or pay over through to ESCOM. Now, this has got a, a trickle down effect, particularly uh, in affecting as well the growth that uh, of the debt that those municipalities owe to ESCOM. However, we feel that it would be a comprehensive approach if such uh, proposals that would be delivered in the 2023 uh, budget also include uh, alleviating some of the debt burden of ESCOM, that there should be a reciprocal uh, approach of uh, alleviating the municipalities, particularly those in financial distress who owe ESCOM, if there is a 10% elevation of the debt burden of ESCOM, and similarly, that 10% uh, be also extended through to those uh, municipalities. One, that will improve their uh, solvency uh, in terms of uh, them, where if in the instance now they are technically insolvent, uh, that would improve and as well improve their uh, liquidity, uh, their current ratio uh, in terms of uh, the short-term uh, debt that they owe to ESCOM, and they could then begin to focus on other aspects as the economy actually uh, improves. As the one indicated that uh, we projection is that we will be now uh, arriving at the pre-pandemic uh, levels that uh, actually uh, deal with that. In terms of uh, in-year reporting, uh, SALGA does not have uh, leg or statutory or legislative powers to get the info uh, from municipalities because we're outside of the loop, but municipalities uh, do are required by law, particularly the MFMA, to report on the Section 71 reports, of which uh, we do get access via National Treasury, where we do monitor, and what we do particularly on the 20, uh, top 20 uh, municipalities who owe ESCOM, we do the financial analysis and then we write le letters to those executive mayors advising them on the uh, cause of action that they should take, particularly in ensuring that they remain uh, financially uh, sustainable. Uh, Kumucho, perhaps you can uh, touch on what I might have uh, uh, forgotten, uh, but I think I've covered mostly uh, the aspects that uh, have been raised uh, in, in, in this respect. Uh, perhaps in, in terms of uh, measures uh, in, for inflation, uh, remember we've got a, a monetary policy a committee that is responsible for, amongst others, safeguarding the currency of the Republic as well as uh, its inflation targeting. However, whenever there is inflation and, uh, and it grows faster than the, the incomes of communities, uh, it comes to, in fact, it's only a logical conclusion that those communities would then have to prioritize their means of survival, which is food, uh, rather than at times paying for the uh, utilities. Hence, we maintain that it would have a detrimental impact on municipal revenue collection. And the chair asked for the exact numbers. I think those we can avail uh, because I do not readily have them, uh, but will send through via the committee secretary. I thank you, Chair, uh, from my part. Uh, Mojo, maybe through you, Chair. Okay, no, thank you, Ngeba, uh, and then good, good morning to, to the Chair and the members. Um, just on the infrastructure uh, network, um, we do conduct our analysis, and of, of course, through the, the special budget forum, uh, on the technical one, which is represented by Saraga Corp and National Treasury. This is one area that has basically been, been flagged, that over the years, municipalities are only spending less than 2% in terms of repairs and maintenance, obviously adding to the infrastructure backlog. So it's through that process that we're looking for 
um, solutions in terms of how to address that uh, in terms of the alternative sources of financing, uh, because we see with the number of financially distressed municipalities generally when that happens that CAPEX tend to, to, to suffer in that particular regard due to the inflexibility in terms of the operational expenditures of, of, of municipalities. Uh, as Saga, we basically partnered uh, with DBSA. Uh, there's a dedicated project in terms of the, on the water side, uh, which is between Saga, DBSA, and, and, and basically uh, DWS. So there, there are funds that has basically been allocated in that particular regard, where it will be assisting municipalities in addressing challenges in terms of the water network. Um, and then, of course, um, on the electricity side, we don't have a dedicated as yet. Uh, something that we're deliberating through the budget forum resolutions. So, of course, it is a concern on, on our side. Uh, we also put in place some training for municipalities um, together with the investor of Pretoria, um, with DBSA as well, in terms of capacitating municipalities around project preparation um, and so that we can start packaging bankable projects that don't necessarily rely on the balance strength of municipalities and we can pursue alternatives like your triple P's. Uh, so we crowd in private investors in that particular regard. And we think that would actually go a great way in terms of just addressing some of the, some of the, of the gap. Um, on the statutory payments part of it, and we're looking at it from overall uh, exposure in terms of creditors. Uh, to, to municipalities and not just ESCOM and basically statutory payments as well. And what we've basically seen with the outstanding debtors book in terms of the debt owed to municipalities that has been going in the wrong direction, um, and especially in the past three years, indicating the inability of municipal consumers basically pay municipalities for services consumed. That has a huge bearing in terms of the ability of municipalities in meeting their own obligations. Uh, so we have been working through the MDRC, which is the Multidisciplinary Revenue Committee that's basically chaired by National Treasury in assisting those municipalities and pursuing especially government um, um, customers um, and as well as businesses. Um, and when it comes to households, we're currently deliberating through the IGR in terms of a much more differentiated approach in terms of addressing that particular aspect of debt owed by, by household. So the jury is still basically out. Um, but the point that we're making a saga that parallel to pursuing and rightfully so, a municipality is actually being disciplined to meet their obligation is also the assistance in terms of making sure that the consumers of municipalities basically pay municipalities because that's positively correlated. So if they can't collect, we see it in terms of them defaulting in terms of obligations, but definitely um, serious matters and financial matters that needs to, to basically resolve. Uh, and we basically um, working on that. Uh, COPTA has got a program that is basically developed in terms of specifically to the 43 municipalities that National Treasury is looking at in terms of developing financial recovery plans for those. Um, and as well, COPTA has got a missed program uh, in terms of deploying capacities in municipalities um, and to help resolve some of the challenges, um, and especially those that probably has to do with operational and processes, and of course, there are other structural issues um, that confront municipalities that will then have to be dealt with uh, differently. So I guess it's those programs between COPTA and National Treasury-led programs to address that, that um, a program the committee should be appraised on in terms of the progress and just monitoring the effectiveness basically of those those interventions. Um, I think Chair, I have covered um, most. Yes. You yes. Have. yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. Komutsu Tatsu. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Salga. Uh, can we then have Rural Health Advocacy Project? Responding to the issues which are raised on on the issues concerning them. I I saw the the, the written on the chat group that uh, they are experiencing a uh, load shading, so they may not be on the platform. They apologize. TB advocacy and accountability consortium. I think they were using the same gadget. If my memory serves me well, um, it looks like they're not there, but they've had the questions. Uh, Secretariat, 
can you please uh, uh, follow up with them so that they give, they give us responses in writing? Uh, Amanda Dotmobi, please come in. Um, thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, sorry. First, let me uh, welcome all the comments and critiques from uh, Honorable Members. Um, those are very welcome, and thank you also for the, the compliments. Um, I specifically want to speak to questions raised by Honorable Shaiki Mam and Honorable Menzana. I'll try and keep it as brief as possible. But the first thing that I want to address, uh, Honorable Chair, is that I think it is important um, as a mother Mobi, as an organization that has been advocating for social grants for a long time, to put it out there that social grants are not against jobs. And I think that is one thing that a lot of people are misunderstanding, that whenever we speak of grants, we, we are somehow discouraging the, the creation of jobs. Um, it is true that no one wants to live on grants for the rest of their lives. But when people have nowhere to tend to, um, they often find themselves needing interventions like grants to survive. So we come here every year to demand things like basic income grant because it is the most efficient way to provide immediate financial support to households. Of course, grants uh, cannot be the way forward forever and ever. People want to work for themselves. But the reality right now is that it is impossible for many people. And this is why it is important for us to make use of what we already have, which are social grants to help people survive. Grants are definitely not um, a way to try to stop government from creating jobs or creating business opportunities and so on. The demands for grants should actually be a motivation for the government to find more efficient ways to allow people to support themselves so they can get off things like you no know, grants. Honorable members, many times when we speak on taxes on the rich, uh, people often mistake that for middle income earners. Honorable members, middle income earners are not rich people, so let's not confuse that. When we say tax the rich, we mean you know expanding um, the tax the tax base. I think that's uh, one of the questions Honorable Mlenz and had asked. Had asked. So not only just uh, taxing multimillionaires, but also increasing taxes for people who own luxury goods. We speak of increasing things like corporate tax and tax on mining companies. I know SARS is already uh, doing some great work in checking people who have attained luxuries and aren't properly paying tax. One thing that I'd like to disagree with that uh, Honorable Sheikh Imam has said is that rich people are leaving the country. While that may be true to some extent, let me put it out there to you, honorable members, that people who have found economic success barely ever relocate for reasons such as needing more money. People who have found economic success are always looking for ways to dodge paying things like more tax and instead gaining more profits by any means necessary. If it were true, certain billionaires that we know of in this country would have already left, but they are not leaving because financially remaining in this country uh, benefits them. And these are the people we are calling for to be taxed more because they cannot remain in this country while they evade tax and make profits at the expense and the exploitation of the poor. If introducing a wealth tax is not a viable method, as Honorable Sheikh Imam said, then it is this government's responsibility to find other ways to fund interventions that will help lift people out of poverty. However, these interventions must not in any way come back to bite the poor. So this could be things like raising value-added tax. And value-added tax, of course, doesn't only hurt poor people. It also hurts middle-income earners because middle-income earners in this country are already uh, struggling you know, to, to afford all the basics they need. Many times you find that people are leaving uh, check to check. So these interventions must, the government must ensure that they do not come back to bite the poor in any way. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. Thank you, uh, Ms. Siopa, uh, Amanda Dotmobi. Can I have section 27 responding to the issues that would have been raised concerning them? Yes, so we had very small um, issues for us. So the first being um, from Honorable Dennis Ryder, who noted that our submission 
tells them that the NHI won't work. We just want to clarify that that's not necessarily our position or the point of our submission. Um, so that's that. And then from Honorable Tulisile Tahiso, um, who, who supports the call for gender responsive budgeting, um, yeah, we support that as well. So yeah, thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Miss um, um, Matsidiso um, from Section Twenty Seven. Can I have uh, uh, Kosat to correct me to come in? Okay. No, thanks. Um, thanks very much, Honourable Chair, to to members. Um, I mean, I think Chair, it's always positive as we face you know huge crises as a, as a nation that you find that members, irrespective of the political party, civil society, largely singing from the same hymn, hymn book. I think that's positive because the challenges require, I think all of us, irrespective of our political preferences or where we are in life, um, to try to address our collective issues. So I think I would agree, Honorable uh, Chairperson, as you always agree with um, Sheikh Imam. Um, <clears throat> I mean, the crisis face, uh, facing us are huge and we, yet we just don't see the leadership that the situation requires from COGTA, from SALGA, from municipalities, even from provincial governments. Um, the, we, the deterioration of local governments, it's, it's alarming. Um, the AG reports, Honorable Chair, really, uh, if you want to be depressed before we can just read the AG reports on local government and you'll be miserable. Um, I think we must also say that, look, we often like to lambast the ANC as a ruling party, but I think increasingly many of these municipalities are actually run by coalitions. And they also we need to see political parties across the aisle taking responsibility for municipalities which fall under their political leadership. Um, the number of municipalities under administration is, is a positive reaction by government to try to halt the situation, but often you find that it doesn't actually address the issues and these same municipalities fall off the wagon a few years later. But the fact is that we have 90% of our local government in financial distress. We don't see what is the plan. And often it is a, it is a capacity, it's a leadership plan. I think as the DM, uh, Comrade David Mosondo correctly said, often this is a problem of leadership. If you look, Chair, there was a report today in, this, in the Citizen about the rising number of municipalities providing unhealthy water supply to communities. So again, we're likely to see health epidemics. Um, Sheikh Imam asked, what exactly do workers, do unions contribute to try to resolve issues? Well, we think number one is that it's workers who provide the labor, who sell the labor, that builds companies, that builds the products, that farms, that runs hospitals. Hey, Comrade Matthew. Hi, Chair. Sorry, allow me to interrupt you, I'm, I'm sorry. It's because I see a, a chat there uh, uh, coming from uh, in the chat group from coming from Maxi Diso saying that she's she's low shading and she also may be leaving. There's a comment that I wanted to make before they all disappear. Just allow me to do that, please. Um, my my apologies. No, um, I just wanted to say I I all members I saw that uh, in the platform uh, from the different uh, uh, <clears throat> organizations there are a lot of young people who appeared before us today, and even more. So young women, young women, I think that we need to encourage that and we're very grateful as, as, as committees because it just shows that young people are having an interest in what is happening in their lives now, in other people's life and in the future of their country. I think that should be commended and we should continue inter, inter, interacting uh, with us, <clears throat> uh, especially because very soon we'll be leaving these chairs that were in and you guys will be coming this side and we'll be coming to you to make our representations as pensioners, as to say, please deal with this and they want more of this and so on and so forth. So I just thought, let me encourage that and please do come back again and don't be, don't tire if certain things don't happen. We do respond, we are responsive as, as uh, you, you mentioned yourself that there was a question of an SRD, a, a grant 350. It was initially uh, intended to be there for a year but we, we, we then saw the need and listened uh, to what you were raising here. I just thought, let me make that, uh, 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 <clears throat> that, that comment and I, I hope I'm representing all uh, uh, the, the members. Thank you. Uh, 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 comrade, may to please uh, 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 proceed. No, no, thanks, Chepas, and, and um, I hope you include me as, among, as amongst the young people, um, that you're not excluding me. But uh, no, no, I, I agree with you, Comrade Chair. In fact, I was quite pleasantly surprised to see that in this uh, daughter bill hearings, I think there's about six organizations presenting, which is a positive shift because at times it might just be, you know, two or three, for example. So that's a very positive thing. Um, so I think we'll we agree with you, Chair. 
No chair, because I mean also this this parliament belongs to everybody, whether you're ANC or FF plus, it's fine. But if you want to fix South Africa solutions, then Parliament is a key institution to raise issues to empower members of Parliament to raise issues with government. So um just to honorable Chef Imam's question about the role of workers. So you know, workers uh, they make the contribution. You'll find that nurses and doctors, because of vacancies in hospitals, are working 48-hour shifts. Often a nurse provide fills uh, three positions because two of them are vacant. We've seen in the police service um, the SAPS headcount decreasing by 30,000 over the past decade. So that has an impact upon officers. You often find that teachers have um, what do you call it, uh, learning camps for learners on weekends over public holidays to try to assist them, especially in the matric years. But also, Chair, many of our workers, um, health workers, municipal cleansing workers, police officers, et cetera, were really exposed to COVID-19. Many of them actually paid with their lives because of it. The effect rates are far higher than the other persons. Uh, Chair, if you look at most of your companies in the stock market, almost all of them depend upon workers' pension funds being invested in them through the PIC, through private investment funds. So those are workers' money which are stimulating the economy. Um, Often they are abused by, by, by people in those companies too, who steal from them. Chair, we will say that you know, in Samu, uh, some of our shop stewards were murdered in Limpopo for blowing the whistle on the corruption of the VBS scandal. We've seen other workers too, when they blow the whistle on corruption, have been murdered in Kaoteng. Chair, I think also that we recognize the crisis require all of us as labor, as business, as government, as society to address these crises. Government can never have enough resources, enough capacity to address them. So you'll find, for example, the sector, the Clothing Workers Union has been quite active with the bargaining council, with business, to try to ramp up local procurement of locally produced clothes, textiles, et cetera. Um, our unions are participating in governments uh, led the sectoral master plans, which cover almost all sectors of the economy, to see how can we address the blockages from agriculture to poultry to motor manufacturing to increase productivity so that we can sustain these companies so that we can save and create jobs. And you know, during, during the last uh, two and a half years of COVID, uh, we had worked quite hard as COSART with a UF colleague, with government, with business, to release 64 billion rand credit free from the Unemployment Insurance Fund. So that's about 40% of the UF's resources to help five and a half million workers who had lost wages. So because we were say it, we want us, us as labor also to make a contribution um, to, to rebuild this country. Chair, I think we want to really appreciate the comments by Honorable Ryder, and to, I think yourself and other members that would hope that Parliament can really help to raise the alarm bells to hold Cogta, Salga, municipalities, provincial governments accountable for the non-payment of salaries and the deductions from workers. I mean, it really is criminal. It can't be right that we have some of them, like uh, Tembelifle, Toying, owing a year's worth of pension deductions. And your members are right. When those workers are injured, when they retire, they're now left penniless. It is a criminal offense to take monies and people should be charged, be the municipal managers. They can't be right that we pay these municipal managers their monies, yet they're pickpocketing workers. Um, in the arguments by, by municipalities that well, they have declining rates of revenue, that's not correct. Local, local government is in, in a crisis because officials are stealing, mis managers are stealing left, right, and center, they're mismanaging it. And yet we're not holding these managers accountable, but we're outsourcing the bill to, to workers. So there has to be some sort of consequence if we were to hold the situation. Some of these municipalities you were snow chair for a decade plus, like Kanaland in the Western Cape, forever in a crisis. And we expect things to improve, yet we have the same mayors, the same managers, and we're surprised when things don't, don't improve. Um, it, it just, we cannot sustain it. So we really also plead with, with our colleagues in the NCP delegates um, from their side also to put pressure on these governments. Because it can't be right that these four provinces, Northern Cape, Eastern Cape, but especially Northwest and Free State are just allowed to continue to, to pickpocket from workers. I think, Chair, just to Honorable Mlenzana, I mean, our frustration with, with local government on the ESCOM debt is that one is increasing. It was 40 billion rand a year ago, it's now over 50 billion rand. Countless times ESCOM has entered into debt repayment agreements with these municipalities, and the same suspects, Maluti or Pafong, et cetera, have not honored those agreements. This forced ESCOM to go to court, which, not, which, which no one wants to attach assets, but something must be done. But it can't be that we continue to see municipalities take the monies from consumers, keep it because of their own funding crisis, they don't hand it to ESCOM. So what we're saying is that half the country which pays, which is on prepaid, they must foot the bill 
and the other half of the country, well, it can just be chaos as always. So I think that the real solution is, and yes, you might have some debt relief, for example, for highly impoverished uh, communities where unemployment is very, very high. You might not be able to recover some funds, sure, but then there needs to be a solution which then says we all move to prepaid. But it can't be, imagine if we would have petrol stations which are operated, uh, you'll pay when you feel like it. The petrol station would collapse. Um, you don't operate a farm like that. No sector of the economy operates like that. Yet somehow we want ESCOM to operate like that. And then we're surprised why ESCOM can't invest in maintenance, can't invest in new generation capacity. Um, ESCOM's debt loss, profit losses every year is about 40 billion rand. And that's almost equal to what municipal debts are. Chair, I think on the issue of the, what Honorable Melanzano said about synchronization, we would agree with that. It would make sense to synchronize national, provincial, as well as municipal budget cycles. We think also the space, if we begin to synchronize collective bargaining across national, provincial, governments, SOEs, et cetera, you can address some of the sustainability, the stability that everybody wants from workers to, to, to government. Um, but again, Chair, we think it's quite alarming that Cocteau is silent, yet we have 40% expenditure by the provincial governments, all of them, and yet we're weeks away from the Christmas period when we know the country is going to shut down for two months. Um, Chair, I think Honorable Chair yourself and Honorable Kaiso um, raised the issue of the post office. Um, again, we have a similar crisis in the post office as you find in some local government, where the post office has not paid workers at times for months, has been deducting medical and pension funds from them, and hasn't provided it handed it over to those medical and pension funds. In this February budget uh, submitted to, to, to parliament, it provided for a retrenchment uh, target of 6,000 out of the 16,000 postal office workers. We think that's going to further decapacitate the post office. And of course, we're quite alarmed by the number of post offices being closed in rural areas uh, because of the failure to pay rent. So I think it's clear that post office is in a crisis. So what can be done to fix it? Uh, we think there are two options that need to be pursued, and we, we're glad governors beginning to pursue them. Um, there's a post office, sort of post bank minimum bill, which is now before the Portfolio Committee on Communications, which is going to enable the post bank to, to, to be a properly established, be a fully fledged uh, bank, and to be linked with the post office using its footprint. That's going to provide, we think, commercial and financial services, banking services uh, to people in rural areas, social grant recipients, etc. So that's critical. There's a post office bill which is coming to Parliament soon, which is going to enable the post office to expand its um, products and offers to society, to include courier services, etc., to include government services. So you could apply for your ID or your social grant or SME funding, etc. So we think that repivoting the post office and the post bank can be critical to saving it. It will need some recapitalization, albeit hopefully once off, to enable them to get on their feet, but also requires proper management to being deployed. If we don't do that, Chair, then we think in two years, this post office will, will, will have completely collapsed. Um, Chair, I think to Honorable Njadu, I think all of us agree what needs to be done. I think it's just about seeing government moving with speed to address the situation before it's too late. And at times we are frustrated that we just don't see government at all levels moving with the speed these crises uh, require. I think Honorable Butilezi, I think the point you're raising is 100% is, is correct. And we had raised the issue of the example of Luxembourg and Frankfurt, because um, we're seeing what is the consequence of collapsing municipalities and basic services in those communities. In many of the economy is basically a few farms and the SOD or SASA pay points. We need to turn things around. Um, the Tonga situation is quite worrying um, because I think we've all been noticing raising the alarm bells of corruption that had been reported at Tonga, Tonga by the auditors. Um, so it is positive that they've gone into business rescue to avoid liquidation, but really we should be having a much stronger leash, so to speak, on corruption in the private sector. I think at times we just ignored it and there's real consequences to workers. And often again, it's pension funds like we saw with, with Steinhoff. There is work that's been done to stabilize the sugar industry, which is critical to KZN to Mpumalanga. There's a sugar master plan and there's been work being done, um, but we think there's much more that needs to be done by the private sector, by the state, by the PIC, et cetera. Um, but I think, Chair, we do need to have a real conversation about what can we do to rebuild local government in rural towns, because if municipalities can't provide roads, sanitation, water, electricity, then companies are going to continue to close, and you're going to continue seeing people having to leave these small rural communities to, 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 to the cities. 
And of course, yeah, there are resources we can help direct to them, like the presidential plumbing stimulus, et cetera. Um, but we need to see more what can be done from the CETA front, for example, to help invest in skills of people in rural areas to attract businesses to, to set up a shop there. But if you don't do something, Chair, it's quite worrying. I think in five years' time, you might be witnessing the entire collapse of large chunks of, of, our, of our rural communities and our municipalities. I think lastly, Chair, to, to, to the metro rail issue, um, no, it is quite a lot. I mean, you, you're right to raise the issue of the non expenditure of the 14 billion rand. Again, it goes back to the issue of capacity, of management capacity, of the ministry, of the department holding them accountable, because you can't just give money and people don't use it when others are desperate. I think we hope that the efforts by Metro to address corruption are, are going to bear fruit. Um, we, we've been working with DTIC with the Minister Patel on the issue of banning scrap metal exports to try to address the cable theft situation. But I think lastly, Chair, is that we need to see SAPs and the Defence Force being deployed to protect our railway infrastructure before it's completely destroyed. And I think we want to encourage the partnerships we've seen being begun, begun by Transnet to work with the private sector security, with the mining industry, et cetera, to begin to protect the railway infrastructure because it really is with like ESCOM critical to the economy's lifeline. So let me stop there, Chair. I know I've taken very, very long. Uh, thanks, Jefferson. Um, that's, that's, that's perfect to give you uh, uh, many, many questions, but uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, let, let me allow um, Wendy and, and Team National Treasure, my apologies, I forgot to in fact, I didn't realize that you were on, 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 on the platform, but the, the issues which have come up, which uh, 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 touch National Treasury, when the, please, can you please come in? Um, most, most certainly, um, I struggled to un, um, do the video, so I'm trying my best. Yeah, there we go. Um, Good afternoon, um, or is it morning stuff? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, the issue was raised about the local government fiscal frameworks quite starkly by um, Solda and um, National Treasury was then also asked um, to express their views. And maybe what is important to, to highlight is that we all know that um, local government is, 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 is um, a lot of municipalities are struggling and um, that um, various types of interventions are required. Um, some of them requires interventions because it's due to bad management and governance issues. But um, there's also concerns often raised that um, the, the funds that's come from the national fiscus is insufficient um, to, to assist um, the municipalities concerned. Um, but there is a working group that we've established and the um, um, Department of Cooperative Governance is part of it, um, National Treasury is part of it, and Salga is also part of it. And we will work together to look at all these issues um, and, and look what can be done um, um, to, to do with the issues raised. But um, it will be useful as well then when we do the, the work referred to, that uh, we look at the, the Paris report um, that Salga referred to. Um, but having said that, um, we must also acknowledge that there's um, quite a bit of inefficiencies in the system and an issue that we need to look at this, where are the funding pressures? Are it on the operating side, um, i.e. salaries, um, um, or is it on the infrastructure side or combination of both? So those type of details need to be looked at, um, but definitely one thing that needs to be looked at is the spending capacity of municipalities. Um, I mean, when we've got the um, reports on expenditure, we often indicate how much money needs to be returned to the fiscus like over 2 billion rand in the MIC, for example, um, due to underspending on conditional grants. Um, so there's also spending capacity issues. Um, and um, as was pointed out, um, if you add money to the system, but there's the inability to spend, um, you create a perverse incentive that monies are spent on, the in on, on wrong things. Um, another issue that we need to look at as well is how the current local government equitable share is used. Um, in terms of analysis that we've done, um, a very um, uh, the, the equitable share portion is much larger than what the equitable share free basic services that are targeted at poor households, um, which is also a concern. So um, we'll look at all those issues in collaboration with the stakeholders concerned. Um, it will be quite a, a detailed review that will be undertaken in this regard. Um, and we will give um, feedback to Parliament um, um, on a regular basis in this regard. Thanks. 
Wendy, um, uh, thank, thank you very much uh, for, for, the, for the input. Honorable members, let, let me take this opportunity and uh, thank South African Local Government Association, uh, Rural Health Advocacy Project, TB Advocacy and Accountability Consortium, Amanda Dotmogi, Section 27, and the Congress of uh, South African Trade Unions uh, for a very valuable interaction. And we really appreciate you have been here, as, uh, as Comrade uh, uh, Matthew Parks was saying, that uh, with about six organizations representing the public, very wide uh, 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 <clears throat> uh, coverage uh, of, of, of society. That's much appreciated. Let me also thank the honorable members, both from the standing committee and the select, select, select committee, and uh, our, our, our support staff. Um, and everybody is on the platform and National Treasury, thank you. And everybody is on the platform. Um, that takes care of agenda item number three uh, and four. Can I check uh, um, from uh, the CDA Committee on Appropriations? Do we have any announcement? Babalu. Thank you, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, Chairperson, is just a reminder um, about the provincial briefings next week, uh, but uh, colleagues in provinces will interact with members because members will be briefing provinces on the division of revenue on Thursday. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Lubabalo. Darren, do you have any announcement? Uh, Chairperson, uh, yes, our next meeting will be on Tuesday where we will be adopting the report on the division of revenue amendment by the Chairperson. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Darren. Uh, apologies, Chair. Means... Apologies, Chair. It's Lubavalo, Chairperson. I would like to bring to your attention that Honorable Writer's hand is up, Chair. Sorry. Honorable Writer, do you want to come in? Chair, yes, and I apologize. I did put my hand up just before Treasury started because uh, Mr. Parks raised an interesting issue that I think it's important for Treasury to, to deal with. I don't want to take us all the way back Perhaps Treasury can just detail it in their response when, when they come back to us. It, it relates to this uh, matter of the post-bank amendment bill that uh, that has been introduced and the fact that it's been introduced through the communications uh, uh, portfolio committee instead of through a finance committee. And it appears to be a money bill and, and not a, a vanilla um, communication style bill. And perhaps Treasury can just give us their opinion on that and, and some comment when they come back to us. I think that's 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 a, 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 a quite a valid comment when you note that, and uh, let's let's see what treasury's national treasury's report is. Okay, got that, Wendy? Okay, thank. Uh, yes, thank I was you. just responding um, per, uh, per, per the notice, but uh, yes, definitely. Okay, thank you, thank thank you. Um, all members, as I said, uh, that was the last agenda item, and, and thank you very much. Please have a very good weekend. Let's hook up next week. The meeting is adjourned. Thanks, Jefferson. Uh, thanks to the presenters. Thank you.